You are alive. Please rise as you are able. I now call this meeting of city council to order. We acknowledge that this meeting is taking place on the traditional land of the Anishinaabeg people. The Anishinaabeg include the Odawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi nations, collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy. We're dedicated to honoring indigenous history and culture, committed to moving forward in the spirit of reconciliation and respect with all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. You may be seated. <clears throat> Okay, uh, tonight's city council meeting is being held virtually, uh, although I'm in the chambers, I should get rid of that virtual background, uh, here in the chambers with the city clerk and the deputy clerk. Uh, all other members of council and the executive management team are participating tonight by video conference. Well, we're all participating by video conference. Uh, the senior leadership team who have reports on tonight's agenda are not visible, but they are available to answer questions uh, if there are any. Uh, the first item of business is the confirmation of the minutes. Minutes of the city council meeting that was held on January 17th, 2022 have been circulated. Are there any corrections to the minutes? Okay, seeing none, the minutes are adopted as printed and circulated. First matter then, or the next matter is deputations on the committee reports. We have 10 deputation requests and two additional emergency deputation requests. Uh, the two emergency deputation requests are from Dave Robinson and Arif um, Edelman uh, regarding motion 22P002, that's the zoning bylaw amendment application for 407, 411, 413, 417, 419, Maple View Drive West. Uh, as the request was received from, uh, uh, as these two requests were received after the printing of the agenda, we do need that two thirds majority vote by members of council in order to hear the emergency deputation. So I'll call that question. I'll those in favor of allowing the emergency deputations, please indicate. None are opposed, that carries. Um, so we will add them to the list and the deputations will occur in the order that they were received, the requests were received by the clerk's office. So I'll be calling out the names as listed on the city council agenda. When your name is called, please unmute yourself. Uh, and if you're on the phone, that's uh, you do that by pressing uh, hashtag six, uh, and in accordance with the city's procedural bylaw, I'll just remind everybody that they have a maximum of five minutes uh, per deputation. I do typically allow a little leeway there when uh, folks have got a lot to say, but um, because we do have 12 deputations tonight, I can only allow a very little bit of leeway. So I'll just ask everybody please to stick to time. I will give you a heads up as your five minutes is coming up and then uh, uh, you will have a very short period of time to to finish your remarks. Okay, uh, so I will call on the first deputation and that is, or the first deputant, that's by um, Janet Foster. And uh, we'll hear all of the deputations regarding the Maple View Drive matter first. Then we have one uh, additional deputation regarding the uh, community reintegration officers for CNCC, we'll hear that at the end. Okay, uh, Ms. Foster, welcome to council. You're no stranger and in accordance with the procedural bylaw, you have up to five minutes. The floor is yours. Okay. Yes. Can you hear me? I'm yes, good to go. Okay. 
Um, good evening, Mayor Lehman and members of council. My name is Janet Foster. I am a professional planner who has been retained by the residents in the Maple View Drive, Redfern Avenue neighborhood. I would like to start off by saying that I have timed my presentation and I am in and around eight minutes. I'm asking for your indulgence for an additional three minutes. Um, the resident's position is that- Sorry, Ms. Foster, I've, I've got to be fair to everybody. So I just want you to know from the outset, I'm going to call you at five minutes and you can have a very short period of time to wrap up, but we got to be fair to everybody. Thanks. Okay. I will try to talk as quickly as I can. The resident's position is that the applicant's proposal for medium density RM2 with special provisions will not result in a medium density development per the standards of the zoning bylaw, but rather would result in a high density development in an area not identified nor included in the official plan policies as an intensification area. The residents are not in objection to a medium density townhouse development and as such are in support of the proposed amended motion recommended for approval by the planning committee. The January 13th, 2022 letter from IPS on behalf of the applicant identified that the development has seen a reduction from 88 to 46 units. As a result of this, the applicant is no longer able to reduce the number of units in this project. At this point in time, the applicant has approval and is permitted by zoning bylaw for five dwelling units on the parcel of land currently zoned R1. Until a rezoning of the lands is finally approved, five dwelling units is the maximum permitted as of right. To state that the applicant is not able to further reduce the number of units is not a fair statement as any rezoning of the site would allow an increase in the number of units from five that is permitted. Any increase in the number of residential units would constitute residential intensification of the site. Until a rezoning is approved, there is no reduction of units, only an increase from the allowable five dwelling units. In the same January 13th letter, the applicant identifies that other projects within the city outside of the identified intensification areas have been approved with increased densities and building heights and where such approvals have set precedence. In accordance with official plan intensification policy 4226D, development applications that propose residential intensification outside of intensification areas will be considered on their merits, provided the scale and physical character of the proposed development is compatible with and can be integrated into the surrounding neighborhood. From this policy, each application must be reviewed from a site and community context perspective. In the January 13th letter, the applicant identified 10 sites where residential intensification has been approved outside of intensification areas. However, what was not mentioned is the individual merit upon which each application was evaluated given the surrounding situation and community context. For instance, the site located at 30 Hanmer Watt Street West was approved for higher density and building height. This site is situated on the boundary with Springwater Township, where to the north the lands are vacant farm fields, to the west is an existing medium density townhouse development, and to the east and south the site is bounded by general commercial retail uses, one being the Paul Sadlin car dealership and the other a commercial retail plaza, both of which front onto Bayfield Street, which is recognized as an intensification corridor. The site at 105 to 111 Edgehill Drive was approved for a medium density townhouse development. This site is bounded to the south by Highway 400 and surrounding the site to the west, north and further east are existing apartment buildings ranging in height from three to 15 stories. It is agreed that there are projects within the city outside of intensification areas that have been approved at higher densities and building heights. However, they have been evaluated on their own merits in accordance with official plan policies given their site and situation in the community context and where precedence cannot be set if each site is evaluated on its own merits. The proposed site is situated in an established primarily low density residential neighborhood characterized by large lots with generous building setbacks from both Maple View Drive and rear yard building setbacks with ground level amenity spaces. On the north side of Maple View Drive from the subject lands, the low density residential development is situated with its rear yards backing onto Maple View Drive with a long linear wood privacy fence that is not conducive to public gathering or porch presence along the Maple View Drive corridor. There are two existing medium density developments quite a distance west of the subject lands that front onto Maple View Drive, one of which is a two-story townhouse development, the other a three-story walk of apartment, both of which provide generous building setbacks, both from the road and the existing rear yard low density residential neighbors. The approval of the applicant's proposal for high density development with building heights exceeding 10 meters would be the first of its kind in this neighborhood and will not provide for appropriate transition between residential dwelling types and with rooftop patios 
um, that will change the character of this community context. The proposed amended motion has been recommended for approval by the planning committee. In the January 31st memorandum from city planning staff, they identify that the proposed amendment following a full technical review of such application would result in a recommendation for approval. The applicant applied to rezone the site from low density R1, the lowest res residential zoning in the city, to medium density RM2. However, the sought after special provisions are seeking a high density form of development in accordance with official plan, where high density is considered to be 54 units per hectare and higher. The applicant currently, the applicant's current proposal is for 72 units per hectare. To put this into perspective, from official plan policies for intensification areas, major transit stations and primary and secondary intensification nodes target residential densities of 50 to 120 units per hectare. Primary and secondary corridors target 50 units per hectare. The applicant's proposal for 72 units per hectare, therefore, is considered high density, which is envisioned and targeted in intensification nodes and corridors. Maple View Drive West is not an intensification corridor. Official plan residential policies encourage enhancing compatibility between dwelling types at different densities to minimize potential conflict and where density shall be graduated to provide for integration between adjoining residential land uses where medium density uses abut low density development, buffering protection will be provided to minimize the impact to the lower density uses. The Ms. Foster, I'll just have to ask you to wrap up your remarks. Thanks. I am. I have two paragraphs. The applicant in their letter of January 13th recognized the need to protect existing vegetation and provide buffering to the adjacent low density residential lots. The amended motion is consistent in that it proposes a minimum 10 meter rear yard setback to enhance buffering, promote ground level amenity space uses and results in further protection of existing vegetation. The restrictions on the size and setback of the second floor balconies restricts their use to barbecuing purposes and not to be used as an elevated outdoor gathering space. In conclusion, the amended motion recommended for approval by planning committee and one that can be supported by planning staff would allow for intensification in an area outside of an intensification node or corridor, would provide the applicant with the desired medium density residential development and a substantial increase in unit count from the five units currently permitted by zoning bylaw, would allow a development that supports public transit, and utilizes existing municipal facilities and services such as parks and infrastructure. In addition, the amended motion would provide additional buffering and rear yard setbacks to the existing residents and maintain the provision of existing mature vegetation. The amended motion recommended for approval by planning committee has considered the public interest and is considered to be good planning. This concludes my deputation. Thank you, Mayor Lehman and members of council for your time and consideration in this matter. Okay, thanks, uh, Ms. Foster, for your deputation. Are there any questions, Ms. Foster? Okay, uh, thanks for being here tonight and for those remarks. Uh, we will move on to our next deputant, and that is Anna Del Cole. Anna, welcome to uh, Barry City Council. In accordance with the procedural bylaw, you have up to five minutes for your deputation. Go ahead. All right, thank you. I just want to confirm. Can everyone hear me? Yep, okay. we can hear you. Yeah. Thank you. I will definitely be brief, and I, I feel like I'm probably just going to say exactly what Janet just said, but uh, in much less technical language. Um, I've had a lot of concerns about this project in its many iterations, and so have a lot of my neighbors. Uh, you know, those concerns include the preservation of the trees, the height of the proposed development, the lack of visitor parking, uh, the need for it to fit the character of the neighborhood, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I feel like at present, the, the, the remaining outstanding concern is still the density. And I think that's mostly what Janet just spoke to. Um, I believe that keeping the density under control makes all of these other issues really manageable. So I, I think, as Janet mentioned, that the maximum density for RM2 is 40 units per hectare. And this plan is still sitting at 70, 72 units per hectare which is still almost twice uh, what is allowable. Um, again, Janet mentioned, we do, not we do not live in an intensification corridor, either under the current official plan or under the new official plan. So this kind of exemption for density, I think would set a fairly dangerous precedent. So I'm, I'm just asking council to stay true to the official plan 
uh, enforce the density restrictions that make sense and give all residents a sense of security. Uh, I think we all just want to know that if we live in a neighborhood like this one, zoned R1 or RM2, full of bungalows and townhouses and two-story homes, that we won't have to face a condo tower being built right next door. Uh, we all just want the official plan to mean something and to be followed. Uh, and I think that what Gary, Har what Gary Harvey has proposed in his amendments, which I believe is 40 to 53 units per hectare, it's still a, a pretty massive increase in density from the five small bungalows that are currently on these properties. As a neighborhood, I think we're all okay with intensification that makes sense. We welcome it, uh, but there's just no need for a density of 72 units per hectare, like other than just the pure profit of the developer in question. Um, and as I know has been mentioned many times in the meetings for this project, the, the developer will be gone as soon as this project is completed, but it's all of us here in the neighborhood who have to live with what remains. Uh, so those are my only comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your deputation. Uh, are there any questions for the deputant from members of council? Okay, seeing none, Anna, thank you very much for being here tonight. Our next deputant is Andrew. Uh, Andrew's, a, I'm sorry, uh, Vanitage. I, I, and I'm probably nowhere close, Andrew. I'm sorry. I know we've met before, but I mangled not, your last name again. Not bad at all, sir. We'll get you there. All right. Uh, welcome it's, to uh, Barry City Council. And as you know, in accordance with the bylaw, you've got up to five minutes for your deputation. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, Councillors, City of Barry staff. My name is Andrew Zavantaz, and I'm a resident of Redfern Avenue. And I'd like to wish all of you a happy Lunar New Year's Eve if you are celebrating tonight. Uh, the development application proposed at 407 to 419 Maple View should not be permitted at its proposed density or height. I urge you to consider its application through a lens of prudence and measured caution. This development, if permitted, would be akin to dropping an aircraft carrier into the Barry Marina and saying it's for the sake of development and it floats on water. It would stand out and not for a good reason. Now, obviously the aircraft carrier analogy is facetious and for effect. However, the proportions are not far off. This application, even at 46 units, is still twice the, almost twice the allowable density for this type of neighborhood and zoning and would fundamentally change the character, look and charm of this ward, if not the entire South End. There's nothing like this anywhere near the homes that would directly abut this complex. And aside from the obvious eyesore, such a large, large complex would be the complementary congestion and parking issues will no, about, no doubt be before council in short order. We should not adopt the develop at all cost policy and we should follow the city's official plan that you have created. This is not an intensification corridor and just being close to one does not mean it should be treated like one. We are reasonable residents making reasonable requests. A modest two to three story townhouse complex would be much more appropriate for the use of this land and would complement the existing neighborhood. Several of you have stated this project bothered you from the outset. I can assure you it has bothered the current tenants of this ward and Redfern Avenue as well. Council is elected to push forward the needs and wishes of his residents, not developers. And I would close by simply saying you have a fantastic opportunity before you to show the entire city how seriously you take its development. And I again urge you to take the amendments before you seriously with a sense of reasonableness and prudence. So let's drop that aircraft carrier into the ocean where it belongs and not into a residential neighborhood. I'd like to thank you for your time and attention, Mr. Mayor. Thanks for your deputation, Andrew. Uh, questions for the deputant? <clears throat> any? Okay, there aren't any. Uh, thank you again for being here and for giving us your remarks tonight. Uh, our next deputant is Cap uh, Cap, welcome to Barry City Council. And in accordance with the procedural bylaw, you have up to five minutes for your deputation. Uh, Councillor Congo, can you give me the thumbs up uh, that I usually get that you can hear me? Okay, there it is. Fantastic. Thank you, Councillor. So thank you, Mayor Lehman, Councillors Ms. Banfield and planning staff for allowing me the opportunity to speak to the rezoning of lands located at 407 419 Maple View Drive West from residential first density R1 to residential multiples de second density RM2 with special zoning provisions. Since this was brought forward on the agenda to council, the neighborhood has remained consistent and realistic in being a partner in shaping this part of our community. At no time have the residents stated, not in my backyard, 
or that this is a parcel of land with five bungalows should be replaced with five homes. The community has only asked that the planning staff and planning committee take into consideration the official plan, which has room for interpretation, but would not contemplate high density development as Maple View Drive West is not an intensification corridor. The proposed development of the subject lands would not be compatible with the adjacent, existing, established, low density residential neighborhood character. This plan is considered to be overdevelopment of the site. This parcel of land is better suited for medium density, not high density. This is not intensification node or corridor in the current official plan or the new official plan. And I know this has been stated by Janet and I'm gonna try not to repeat myself here. Uh, you know, Janet made a lot of great remarks. I had the opportunity to meet with IPS to hear, that their, to hear their rationale. And unfortunately, they identified that the height and density was not up for discussion. I understand that they have brought their unit count down from 88 to 46 units. And to some, that may seem reasonable. However, in accordance with the official plan, this is still considered high density. I wanted to address the concerns I have heard from the decision makers. I've heard loud and clear that we need more housing in Barrie from the, from the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, Steve Clark. I don't believe, however, that Minister Clark's intention is to increase densities in all areas just to build housing that is not in accordance with official plan policies for intensification. The province wants to work with local governments and partners across Ontario to build safe and strong urban and rural communities and affordable and suitable housing, not homes at all costs. Secondly, I understand from planning staff that the surrounding community was determined to have existing density of 20 units per hectare. I was told by planning staff that some properties will occur below that the standard target and others may develop above these densities when supporting the creation of complete communities. In other words, if we can't build as many units down the street, we will load up on the units where we can. That is not good planning, nor is it part of the official plan, new or old. That's irresponsible. Third, going against staff does not always have a good look. However, not doing the right thing is worse. There is a mechanism in place. And while the planning committee has great responsibility towards building homes, it also has a responsibility to the residents of Barrie. At this point, the planning committee has recommended approval of zoning that is more in keeping with medium density RM2 standards. Overturning this recommended approval and allowing the applicant's proposal could be precedent setting for this community. Every proposal needs to be looked at on its own merit, and this high density project is in this area is not in character and not conducive to a primarily low density established neighborhood. On December in December 2020, a councillor said planning is about compromise. And, and that comment really resonated with me. And I believe that the amendments brought forward are fair, are just, and equitable. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you very much for your deputation, uh, Mr. Oppel. Are there any questions of this deputant from members of council? Okay, seeing none. Uh, thank you very much for being here tonight. Thanks for your deputation. Uh, we will move to our next uh, deputants who are Doug and Maria Rowling. Doug, welcome to Barry City Council. And in accordance with the procedural bylaw, you have up to five minutes for your deputation. Welcome. Thank you, folks. I won't take up the full five minutes, that's for sure. But uh, uh, I've heard my neighbors and my, uh, you know, and Janet uh, pretty much state everything that needs to be stated. I'm, I guess I should mention at 27 Redfern, I don't specifically see this uh, development in my backyard, but I can certainly see it from the side and it's, uh, its height is what scares me. And and just, just to reiterate one more time, the, the point that was made about turning this very nice community into a parking lot, our street into a parking lot for the uh, for the development really does scare me. But again, it's already been mentioned, so I'll leave it at that. And, and I thank you for listening to every, every comment said. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Mr. Rowling, for being here and for giving us those comments. Any questions for the deputant members of council? Okay, seeing none, thanks for being here. Uh, and we will move on to our next deputant, who is Sarah Davis. Ms. Davis, welcome to Barry City Council. And in accordance with the procedural bylaw, you have up to five minutes for your deputation. Thank you. 
I'd like to thank everyone for just giving me an opportunity to speak at this initiative. Um, again, I don't want to repeat what most people have already stated. That's no benefit. Um, I'm at uh, 21 Redfern. And I'd just like to say that, you know, we as a community um, hired Janet to speak for us and for the neighborhood, just based on her experience and everything else. She's got the knowledge. Uh, she understands, based on what we've said, it's not development that we're against. You know, it's the density of the development. And I know that that's been brought up again. So in short, I would just like to say that I support what Janet has said. And while it's not perfect, I believe that the amendment Councillor Harvey has brought forth is also a relatively ideal compromise between the two parties. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Ms. Davis, for your deputation. Any questions for the deputant, members of council? Okay, seeing none, thank you again, uh, Sarah, for being here and giving us those comments. Uh, next, we have Darren Vella from Innovative Planning Solutions on behalf of the Encore Group. Mr. Vella, welcome to Barry City Council. And as you know, in accordance with the procedural bylaw, you have up to five minutes for your deputation. Thank you, Worship. <clears throat> I just asked before I'm able to start if I could just share my screen. Sure. Okay, we can see it now, Mr. Vela. That being said, we can't hear you yet. You may still be on mute on your end. Here we go again. Thanks. There we go. Now we can hear you. Darren Vella from IPS Consulting. I'm here this evening on behalf of Encore Group. I'm here on a without prejudice basis. I've had an opportunity to watch the last two planning committee meetings, listening to the deliberations on this project. I'm hopeful that the information I'm about to present will assist Council in considering overturning Planning Committee's decision on this project. It is my opinion that our 46 unit development is the right project for this property, and I remind Council that the Planning Department also agrees with that opinion. I want to start off by saying that we are in agreement with some of Councillor Harvey's proposed amendments as they relate to the rear yard traditional townhouse units backing on to Redfern Avenue. Our concern with Councillor Harvey's proposed amendments relate to the height and density of the units facing Maple Leaf Drive. So from a context perspective, I just wanted to show Council and make it very clear that Councillor Harvey's reference to the three-story seniors building that he feels establishes the character of this area is located approximately 925 meters away from the S Road intensification corridor. In comparing this to our location, you will see that our site is located just 280 meters from the intensification corridor. One can reasonably expect that the closer you get to an intensification area, densities and heights can slightly increase. In my, in my professional planning opinion, this is commonly known and understood. To further understand this concept, the following slide provides a block plan showing the relationship of the subject property with land along Maple View Drive and the intensification corridor. To the right of the slide, the lands colored in orange and red represent some of the lands that will see a higher density of development, which is permitted in both the existing and proposed official plans along the S Road Maple View intersection. As you progress west from the intersection, I have laid out a block plan to help understand how the community will evolve from east to west. As you can see, heights and densities will lower as, will lower as you move further away from the intensification corridor. The 407-419 Maple View site is shown on the plan as a three and a half story back-to-back -back townhouse block with rooftop balconies. Out of the 46 units proposed for this site, only eight units have balconies that exceed 10 meters of height. The following is a cross section that is intended to clear up any misconceptions regarding our proposed height. Our three and a half story back-to-back -back units are proposed all below 10 meters 
with the exception of the eight units fronting Maple View Drive that possess a very small structure, which is highlighted within the red circle that exceeds the height requirement. This access, this access room is set back a considerable distance from the front wall of the units along Maple View. This room provides access to a private rooftop patio only for eight units fronting Maple View Drive. Councilor Natty Harris, I wanted to highlight this as at the last planning committee meeting, you made mention of concern about people being on the rooftop balconies overlooking neighboring pools. That is not the case with this project. And as I mentioned, we are in agreement with all of Councilor Harvey's recommendations on the Redford side townhouses. Our rooftop balconies were designed with the city's urban design department as this outdoor amenity space would protect the architectural design of the units fronting Maple View and would provide a superior private amenity for these eight units and owners overall mental health. Having a barbecue or outdoor dining table would be much more appropriate here compared to a balcony looking right upon Maple View Drive. Once again, I want to make it clear to council that this space is only for eight out of the 46 units. The following image shows the separation distance from these rooftop balconies to neighboring properties. As you can see, the rooftop balconies in the black hatch area only front along Maple View Drive. The separation distance for those units on the north side of Maple View Drive to our rooftop balconies is a minimum 36.8 meters or 120.7 feet. No other units will have rooftop balconies in this development. To further illustrate separation and buffer here, once again, is a cross section of Maple View Drive at 417 Maple View Drive looking to the east. This uh, cross section not only shows the substantial four lane road that separates the rooftop balconies from residents on the north side, but also the substantial vegetation that exists that will create a further buffer. The image on the top of the slide was presented by Councillor Harvey at the last planning committee meeting. This image is 1000% inaccurate and does not represent the condition that council would approve under the 46 unit plan. The image below showing our three and a half story back to back units with eight rooftop patios provides an accurate perspective of the height and separation distance from our units to the neighbors. Council, I would like you to note the substantial separation distance to the other parcels to the east and west. The buffers are extremely large, provide greater setbacks compared to the three-story seniors building that Council Harvey has referred to in this neighborhood. In looking at the seniors building in more detail, you will see that the height of this building is very similar to our development. The majority of this building is 10 meters in height, with other areas increasing to 12 meters. This building is also set back to 6.5 meters to the neighbor's backyards on Ginger Drive, which are single family homes. This building contains balconies directly overlooking numerous backyards. The setback from our eight rooftop balconies is overlooking residents on the other side of Maple View Drive is six times greater than this setback. There are more similarities to the heights of this building and our project than there are differences. Council, remember, our site is located three times closer to the Esser Road intensification corridor compared to this property. We have listened to the concerns from the residents. We have made sure that this development fits into the character of the area. Reminding Mr. Bell, you're getting close to your five minutes and I did allow Ms. Foster a minute or two extra, so allow you a minute or two extra too. Thank you, Worship. Very quickly running through our 88 unit proposal at the neighborhood meeting, our 72 unit proposal presented at the public meeting, our 62 unit proposal that was present, presented to planning staff, and finally, our 46 unit proposal and the issue of density. So what makes a site too dense? Does a developer reducing their project by 42 units not come into consideration? Do we have inappropriate setbacks? All of our setbacks from the rear yard, side yards greatly exceed the requirements. We have more than two parking spaces per unit. All of the trees in the rear yards are being maintained. We are increasing the size of the public walkway to Redfern Park for the betterment of the community. There are no concerns from the fire department. There are no concerns from the traffic department. This development is not out of character. And all we are really talking about is should the city provide an additional 12 units along the Maple View Drive frontage that would be more affordable compared to traditional townhouse units. Recent approvals outside intensification areas, I want to point to this one, which was a 22 meter high building on Veterans Drive, uh, adjacent to single family homes on Montserrat. 
I've provided an image in the bottom corner of the low density single family homes that are immediately abutting this development. This project was approved along with Councillor Harvey's support. So here's the proposed amendments by Councillor Harvey. I just want to point out your worship that the ones in red we are not in agreement with and the ones in green we are. This here highlights uh, H, but on the next page, you will see the substantial number of modifications proposed by Councillor Harvey we are in agreement with. The only issue we have with the fence uh, relates to ensuring that the trees are maintained with, in, instead of cutting the, the uh, trees down in replace of the fence. So in, in conclusion, Council, Encore Group does not have any intention of submitting a revised proposal. Staff have identified to you in a circulation memo that they are not going to be providing a recommendation without a formal application. We feel that this plan is a fair compromise and balances the concerns of the neighbors against Barry growing into a mid-sized city. Encore is a reputable developer. Council, I want to make it clear that if you are voting with Councillor Harvey, you are voting against developing more attainable units in this part of the city. His revised bylaw seeks to developing the exact same... I need you to wrap it up, Mr. Vella, sorry. The exact same footprint with, with the same number of units. And that's all, Your Worship. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vella, for the deputation and... Uh, for the material. Now, to be clear, the material has been circulated to Council, so uh, I know you had to go buy that in a hurry, but uh, we have received the material that's been sent in, as long as well as everyone else's uh, submissions. Uh, are there any questions for this deputant, uh, members of Council? Okay, and uh, I, because you did have to go buy it in a hurry, Mr. Vela, uh, I believe you indicated that there, there's support from your uh, client for uh, a number of the uh, components of the amendment that Councillor Harvey brought forward, and they're opposed to uh, the ones that you had listed in red in your presentation. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct, Your Worship. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Vela, for your deputation. Uh, we will move on to our next deputant, who is Andrew Barnett. Mr. Barnett, welcome to Barry City Council. In accordance with the procedural bylaw, you have five minutes for your deputation. Mr. Barnett, we can't hear you yet. Doesn't look like you're on mute. Oh, still can't hear you. Uh, I can see your hand up function, Mr. Barnett in Zoom, but uh, we can't hear you yet. Oh, hello. Had you there for a second. Uh, I think I've got it. Have I? There we go. Now we got you. Go ahead. Uh, I'm going to start. No. Nope. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. I'm going to start talking. Me. Okay. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so first of all, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor and uh, Council for hearing me. Um, I'm going to reiterate some of the other uh, neighbors' uh, concerns with the development. Hard to follow Darren here with his, uh, you know, promising outlook on the development, but I don't share his opinion there that it's uh, not out of character for the neighborhood. So um this section of maple view it, it's not deemed infrastructure and corridor by the province or the city so let's just be clear about that it is not part of the essa corridor that's i know it's it's close but it's not so let's just agree with that um I, although i agree that this portion can be developed or should be developed um there's no need to put a building in there of this height so again i agree with Councillor harvey and also with uh, Janet Foster's uh, comments that something could be developed in there, but this, this height and density is not warranted. Um, the existing single family dwellings that will neighbor this building obviously are gonna be affected by it. Even if the rooftop patio is only facing the Maple Beef side, the, the windows on the back side of this are gonna look into the Redfern 
uh, Avenue properties directly into their backyard. So there is going to be a, a privacy issue uh, that's uh, that's going to happen with this development. So um, this doesn't fit our official plan, correct? So if it doesn't, a, a council at this point has the opportunity to say, no, let's look at this and make us an intelligent decision on how we want to develop the city. It, it, it may be using this particular project to move forward with that, but at some point there has to be some common sense used when you're talking about intensification and what areas that intensification is going to occur in. Um, so I, I do agree with Councillor Harvey with his motions that he put forward in the um, committee uh, planning committee uh, meeting. So uh, with that being said, I will thank you again for letting me speak and uh, good luck with your decision. Thanks very much, uh, Thanks. Mr. Barnett, for the deputation. Any questions for the deputant, members of council? Okay, seeing none, thank you for being here, sir, and giving us your remarks. Our next deputant is Kent Burtonshaw. Kent, let's see if we can get Mr. Burtonshaw in here. Mayor Lehman, Mr. Birkinshaw is not on the line. Okay, uh, we'll move on to the next, the last uh, two who are the emergency deputants and Mr. Birkinshaw joins us. We can put him on again uh, at the end. Our next deputant then is Dave Robinson. Mr. Robinson, welcome to Barry City Council in accordance with the procedural bylaw. You have five minutes for your deputation. But we can't hear you yet. No, nope, still can't uh, still can't hear you, Dave, if you can hear us. Mr. Robinson, if you can hear us and there's anything else you want to try, if not, we might just hear the next deputation and we'll see if you can get those sound issues sorted out for us. Doesn't sound like it. Okay. Uh, well, perhaps somebody can contact Mr. Robinson, see if we can help him with his sound and we'll move on to our next deputant who is Arif uh, Adamon. Arif. Hello. Hi, now we can hear you. Welcome to Barry City Council. And in accordance with our procedural bylaw, you have up to five minutes for your deputation. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, dear councillors. I'm a resident of Redfern Avenue. As my neighbors have discussed before me and in trying to avoid repetition, we ask that the planning committee to, cons to consider that the development must be in accordance with the neighborhood character. The proposed development is not in line with the permitted zoning and is closer to a high density area. The development will change the feel and the charm of the neighborhood. I have severe concerns with the lack of parking provided and the increased traffic in the area on Redfern Avenue. To address some of the presentation contents of the IPS representative, this area is not within the intensification zone and council should reconsider making the decision process. The neighborhood feels uncomfortable with the height of the building provided overlooking into private properties. And again, we are concerned about parking provided by the developer, especially visitor parking. The proposed development is not the right fit for this neighborhood. That is all. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your deputation. Uh, I'll ask if any members of council have any questions for this deputant. Okay, seeing none, uh, thank you for being here, sir, and for giving us your deputation. Um, let's try Kent Burtonshaw again. Is Mr. Burtonshaw online? No, Mayor Lehman. 
No, no, Mr. Burton Shaw. How about we try Dave Robinson again and see if he's got his sound working? All right, we can uh, see your Hollywood Square here, Mr. Robinson, if you can unmute and hopefully your sound is working this time. Still showing, a, oh, Mr. Robinson. Still can't hear you, I'm afraid. No, sorry, Mr. Robinson, does not sound like we can uh, hear you tonight. I'm not sure what's going on there, but uh, my suggestion would be um, if, uh, if you're able to call in or reach our staff, uh, maybe they can help you with it. Uh, if not, you're, they're of course able to make a, a written submission uh, that all members of council will receive uh, at any point. All you've got to do is send that in to us. Um, so what we'll do is go on and hear our second deputation on the next matter. Uh, and hopefully uh, maybe Mr. Robinson, there's a, something you can do in the last minute or two here to get your sound working and we'll bring you back in after that. But if not, feel free to write with us, write to us. We will all receive uh, your deputation that way. Um, so we'll just call on our next deputant who's Megan Chambers. Uh, Executive Director for the Elizabeth Fry Society of Simcoe County, uh, sorry, Simcoe Muskoka. And this is uh, concerning motion 22G013. This is the request of the province for community reintegration officers for CNCC, the Central North Correctional Center. Ms. Chambers, welcome to Barry City Council. In accordance with our procedural bylaw, you have up to five minutes for your deputation. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Perfect. Thank you, Mary Lehman and members of council for allowing me to speak on the request the letter be sent to the Solicitor General requesting that community reintegration officers be provided to Central North Correctional Center. I wanted to first mention that I did receive communication from the Manager of Social Work and Rehabilitative Services at CNCC confirming that the institution will be getting community reintegration officers and that the ministry is rolling out placement of these positions in phases. At this time, CNCC has not been given a start date for their institution. That being said, it is important to highlight the need and urgency for reintegration and discharge supports for vulnerable populations as we are experiencing a local housing crisis exacerbated by high rental rates and are nearing capacity within our local shelter system. The deficiencies in adequate discharge planning of vulnerable citizens from CNCC has long, long been acknowledged by community organizations providing services to populations who are or at risk of being criminalized and experiencing homelessness. For many years, countless individuals with no fixed address or who are transient from neighboring communities were dropped off at the Barry bus terminal after discharge from the institution left to seek emergency shelter or await a bus transfer to their home communities with only the clothing and personal effects that they were initially arrested with and a looming unrealistic expectation of success. The beginning of the pandemic highlighted additional deficits in the discharge and reintegration planning process. Public health introduced recommendations for emergency shelters to implement a 10-day quarantine period for anyone transferring from one congregate setting to another inclusive of those who have been incarcerated. Two years later, most citizens of the general public know well the preparation required for one to quarantine. You need shelter, access to your medications, personal belongings, personal care items, and identification to access COVID testing. For someone without, without housing who is being discharged from an inst institution, these basic needs required supported coordination. In spring 2020, Elizabeth Fry Society and the Busby Centre began weekly calls with CNCC, CNCC to address discharge needs through collaboration to ensure that those being released with no fixed address from our local community were supported and prepared for transition to shelter, and that those from surrounding communities were supported through outreach and connected to transportation to their home communities. The post-incarceration transition program funded through Reaching Home and facilitated by Elizabeth Fry Society was designed and implemented in May 2021 to address discharge shortfalls affecting criminalized individuals who were being discharged within Simcoe County with no fixed address. This program aims to increase homelessness diversion by exploring an individual's available housing or sheltering resources outside of the emergency shelter system 
and decrease discharges from the institution to street homelessness by providing community-based supports and system coordination. To date, the program has supported 40 individuals, 37 of whom have accessed emergency shelter, and all have been provided very varied individualized supports from incarceration through, in some cases, to housing. This program is one of several across the sector working to support marginalized and criminalized individuals to address needs post-incarceration. Locally, individuals are also supported through the John Howard Society, Salvation Army, Barry Native Friendship Center, and the Busby Center, to name a few. Although current collaboration with the institution and community-based programs and supports have helped intervene on a number of people being released from incarceration directly to street homelessness locally, there's still, still many system shortfalls. Currently, discharge planning at CNCC is often focused on those who have been sentenced with predetermined discharge dates meaning the population who is incarcerated on remand is often, often overlooked and has little to no support or time facilitating their discharge plan. Vulnerable populations are often over-policed, under-protected, and criminalized for systemic causes related to poverty, race, homelessness, trauma, mental health, and addictions. Inadequate reintegration supports before institutional discharge lead to system failures faced by the most vulnerable citizens. A true way to reduce recidivism rates is to ensure that the needs of people who have been incarcerated are met and that they're provided adequate ongoing support and individualized planning. I would like to extend my support in favor of the motion presented in the hopes that it will highlight a sense of urgency for enhanced support required to increase the probability of one's safety and well-being through supported transition from imprisonment to home communities and that the implementation of reintegration rules decreasing the probability of reincarceration of vulnerable people is of utmost importance. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Chambers, for your deputation, uh, and uh, appreciate the, uh, uh, the perspective from somebody who's delivering this service on the front line, for sure. Uh, Councillor Jim Harris, question. Yeah, thank you, Relief, and thank you, Ms. Chambers. Um, yeah, when you read the motion, it's it's almost shocking that of 25 um, reintegration officers being invested in not one in an area that has a has a correctional center uh, like CNCC. It just so can, can you give us some? I mean, it's great that we can write a letter in support of this. You're closer to this work and and the advocacy and planning for release from custody services in Simcoe. What has been done, and, and from your perspective, why hasn't Simcoe or Barry been um, on the radar to receive one of these 25 um, positions? There has been a lot of collaboration that has happened among community organizations and the institution, uh, most recently in the past uh, two years specifically. Uh, the Busby Center and Elizabeth Fry Society have really taken on some liaison work with institutional discharge planners um, system system wide and Simcoe County wide to be able to help coordinate some of the discharges that are hop happening of people with with no fixed address. Um, that being said, I can't I can't speak to why CNCC wasn't chose. I can't speak to the direction of the ministry and why they've chosen certain communities over others. Okay, thanks. That might answer my follow up, which is, is it because we're, I'm not, I wouldn't think we are, but, you know, if you did a map of, map of the province, are we equitably distributed now? Are we ahead of the game? Or I would assume we're behind it, but maybe you do know if we're actually behind, and this is just further having us fall behind even farther than other areas, or, or is there a, like a distribution of these type of workers across the province, and where do we sit? Would you know that answer? I would suggest uh, that the need across the province is equal in all institutions. I, I am a provincial advocate with our uh, provincial based network doing inspections of review and of conditions of confinement across the province. And uh, the issues that we experience locally are certainly not unique. Okay, thank you. And I imagine there's coordination with the least custody workers through C CMHA. I gather that's part of the team effort in Zipco. Yes, there's lots of different community organizations and in five minutes, unfortunately, I certainly couldn't highlight all of them. Thank you very much and, and I hope this does come to fruition. Thank you again. Thanks very much, uh, Councillor Kungle and then Councillor Reema, questions of the deputy. Thank you, through you, Mayor Lehman to Ms. Chambers. 
Uh, do you have any information at hand um, as to whether Central North Correction Center is also responding for a call for either rationale or a request for consideration should, I don't even know if this program will continue to be expanded past the 25, but is there any other action you would recommend um, City Council take in support of not just a letter as we've positioned it, um, requesting it, but any partnership approach um, or support in any way for Central North Correction Center if they're taking any actions on their own on this? As mentioned, they, ha they have received confirmation that they are receiving uh, these positions within the inst institution, but they don't have a timeline of start date. Um, from my understanding um, and my knowledge, and, and please know that I don't represent the institution or, or speak on their behalf, but I'm not aware of any additional efforts that they are taking um, to speed the process. And follow up just for point of clarification, because I thought you said one and then I thought we went back to none. So um, just for my own uh, sense of clarity, those 25 new community integration reintegration officers, um, there will be one position embedded within the center. Is that correct? Sorry for clarification. The 25 that were announced were not dedicated to Central North Correctional Center. The institution has been told that they will be getting positions, but they don't know when. So it's a phased approach that's happening. The provincial announcement announced the 25 dedicated to the institutions that they've announced, but didn't include CNCC in whatever phase this is. Thank you, Ms. Chambers. So last follow up. Um, I'm just wondering about whether or not with that context, you would recommend if we made a comment in reference to that at all or encouraged any type of um, expedited uh, time frame to see that position occur, although it wasn't part of the 25. My recommendation would certainly be to um, put forward the urgency on the matter and that, that positions be allocated at the earliest they can be. Thank you very much. No further questions and thanks for all you're doing across our communities. Sorry about that, Councilor Reepma, question. Thank you, I just had a question about um, how many uh, people are discharged um, on a say annual basis uh, that uh, come to uh, Barrie or the general Barrie area. Do you know roughly how many people we're talking about um, that get discharged? I don't have the stats direct from the institution of where people are being discharged to. Um, I can speak to the statistics of our post-incarceration transition program. As of May 2021, we've had 40 individuals come through that program who are experiencing, who are unhoused and experiencing homelessness. Uh, so I can speak to that component. I would also point to the 2020 homelessness enumeration that, that has components um, and references incarceration rates of people experiencing homelessness in that report. Um, but I don't have it handy to, to speak to the exact data. Okay, thank you. Um, I, um, you spoke about um, these positions that are, are the 25 positions in total. Um, do you know how many are going to be assigned to uh, CNCC or, or is that still up in the air as well? We don't know the timing, but do we know the number? I don't know. I've been told positions. I don't know the number of positions that will be allocated. Okay, thank you. Councillor Owen. Thank you, Mary Lehman. Uh, and, and thank you, Megan, for your presentation. And thank you to you and your team for all the work you're doing in the shelter system as well uh, over the past two years. I, I know it isn't easy. Um, you talked about in your presentation about how incarceration um, can actually lead to more harm for the people who are incarcerated and uh, increased recidivism, um, which, I mean, it's crazy when you think about it, our criminal legal system working the opposite of the way it's supposed to work. Uh, can you maybe speak to that a bit and what are the reasons for um, why incarcerated people who are released may not be better off than when uh, they entered prison? Certainly. Um, it, periods of incarceration can are, are actually quite traumatic for people. Um, as, as, as I mentioned, I do go into institutions as a 
advocate to review conditions of confinement. And I can tell you from being inside uh, the institutions across the province that it is, um, the conditions are, are quite glaring and, and can cause um, trauma and exacerbated mental health um, due to those experiences. Um, speaking to sort of the relation between incarceration and homelessness, there, there tends to be a very cyclical nature between an experience of homelessness and, and the sort of over-policing and incarceration of people experiencing homelessness. And then when you're in a period of an incarceration, certainly it causes instability um, in, in life, in housing, in employment, in, in family stability that can actually lead to homelessness. Thank you for that. I've got a lot of work to do. Okay, any other questions of the deputant? Okay, seeing none, um, Megan, while you're here, I wanted to uh, take the opportunity also to thank you for your work in our community operating the Elizabeth Fry uh, programs and center in, in Barrie. Um, we would be uh, in a lot of trouble without your organization and your partners in the shelter system. So thank you very much for the work that you do. Thank you, I appreciate the support. Uh, okay, we, uh, I think, have got Mr. Robinson uh, back um, on the, uh, as another resident deputation on the previous matter, the Maple View matter. Mr. Robinson, go ahead. Hello? Yes, can we hear can me? hear you. Hey, there we go. All right, welcome to uh, City Council, and you have up to five minutes for your deputation. I apologize for the uh, inconvenience there earlier. Uh, it's my microphone on the computer was not working. Uh, yes, I uh, enjoyed Darren's little presentation and uh, I noted he only uh, addressed blocks one and two that are directly uh, facing Mapleview and not three, four and five, which are on the residential side of uh, Redfern uh, with balconies that overlook uh, my pool. Uh, this de development as it stands will invade my privacy and devalue my property. Uh, everybody else has already said much of uh, what already has been uh, the other problems with it. I purchased the property with the understanding that it's a low density and would remain low density and uh, and that there was some expectations of privacy in my backyard. As it stands right now, there is absolutely none. And I don't see, I uh, haven't seen anybody come forward with any kind of uh, solution to uh, address that from the developer. And that's just about all I got to say since everything else has already been said. Hey, Mr. Robinson, uh, thank you for uh, bearing with the technology until we got one that worked for you or you got one that worked for us. Uh, any questions from members of the city council or this deputant? Okay, seeing none, uh, thanks for being here, Mr. Robinson and uh, for giving us your deputation. Uh, that completes our deputations on the committee reports tonight. Both of those matters will be up very shortly uh, because we can, I think now, proceed to the committee reports. We can. Uh, Deputy Mayor Ward, I believe you have the motions. Thank you. Moved by myself. Seconded by Councillor Thompson that Section A of the Planning Committee report dated January 18th, 2022, circulated be received. Thank you. It is moved by Deputy Mayor Ward. Seconded by Councillor Thompson that Section A of the Planning Committee report dated January 18th, 2022, as circulated, be received. This is to receive the presentation concerning Barry's new official plan. Uh, it's for receipt. Comments or questions? Seeing none, those in favor of section A? Anybody opposed? None. That carries. Section B, please. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Thompson. The section B of the planning committee report dated January 18th, 2022, as circulated, be adopted. Okay, it's moved by Deputy Mayor Ward, seconded by Councillor Thompson that section B of the planning committee report dated January 18th, 2022 as circulated be adopted. This is the referral motion for the zoning bylaw amendment application for 407 to 419 Maple View Drive West. Councillor Harvey. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Uh, I'd first like to start off uh, with a question for staff. Um, 
I, I know since uh, we were uh, at planning committee two weeks ago and this referral motion um, came about, um, staff have provided an eight page memo that is uh, on uh, this week's circulation list. Um, so my question to Ms. Banfield would be outside of that uh, eight page um, memo that's been provided to us, at this stage of this application, is there any further information that this referral motion would, uh, that your staff would be able to provide to council uh, moving forward? Through you, Mayor Lehman, to Councillor Harvey, in the absence of a revision to the application, um, no, there's nothing else that planning staff can provide to council for as part of their consideration of this application. Great, thank you, Ms. Banfield. Um, Mayor Lehman, uh, with that uh, information being before us, um, I, I am uh, going to request that uh, members of council vote against this referral motion and that we move forward tonight and make a decision on this matter since there's going to be no further information that's going to be uh, plausible uh, coming from staff uh, at the current juncture that we're at. Okay, is it your intention then to uh, uh, move an amendment, uh, Councillor Harvey? Uh, yes, uh, just for procedural pieces, I would suspect we would have to vote against the referral and then yes, my intent is to uh, bring forward another amendment. No, I think we can actually just uh, delete the referral and uh, move ahead with your amendment. So not that it matters particularly, I think the outcome is the same either either way, but uh, you can go ahead and put that on the floor as an amendment to Councillor Harvey if it's what's been circulated to members of council. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you, Mayor Lehman. Um, so moved by myself and seconded by uh, Deputy Mayor Ward, uh, that motion 22P 002 of section B of the planning committee report dated January 18th, 2022 be deleted and replaced with one that further to the zoning bylaw amendment application submitted by innovative planning solutions on behalf of 407 to 419 Maple View Inc. and Encore Group to rezone lands known municipally as 407, 409, 413, 417 and 419 Maple View Drive East residential multiple dwelling second density RM2 zoning be approved without any special provisions and that the applicant be requested to submit a revised site plan that meets the RM2 zoning requested. Two, that a holding provision be put on the zoning bylaw for 407, 409, 413, 417 and 419 Maple View Drive East, residential multiple dwelling dent second density RM2 until the applicant re receives site plan approval. Three, that site plan approval be bumped up to council for their approval. Four, that the written and oral submissions received relating to this application have been on balance taken into consideration as part of the deliberations and final decision related to the approval of the application as amended, including matters raised in these submissions and identified within staff report DEV 026-21 and five that pursuant to section 34 sub 7 of the planning act no further notification is required prior to the passing of this bylaw okay uh, members of council i believe you have received a copy of this proposed amendment uh, but because we have lots of people watching i'll quickly run through it uh, it is to delete the referral motion and instead uh, that for further to the zoning bylaw amendment application submitted by IPS on behalf of 407-419 Maple View Inc. and Encore Group, uh, that uh, the uh, RM2 zoning be approved without any special provisions. That's the material part of paragraph one, and that the applicant be requested to submit a revised site plan that meets the RM2 zoning uh, requested. Two, that a holding provision be put on the zoning bylaw for 407-419 Maple View Drive East uh, RM2 until the applicant receives site plan approval. Uh, three, that the site plan approval be bumped up to council for our approval. Four, that the written and oral submissions received in this application have been on balance taken into consideration as part of the deliberations and final decision related to the approval of the application as amended, including the matters raised in those submissions and identified in the staff report. Five, that pursuant to section 3417 of the Planning Act, no further public notifications required prior to the passing of the bylaw. 
Okay, um, so Councillor Harvey, on your amendment, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, staff for assisting me in, in coming up with uh, the wording because I can't take credit for all of this when it comes to the, this uh, type of amendment moving forward. And I would ask if uh, my PowerPoint could be put up on the screen, please. Councillor Harvey, I will just uh, warn you at the offset at the outset, we are also all of us subject to the five minute limit at City Council. I did give both Ms. Foster and Mr. Vela uh, several extra minutes. And so we'll give you those extra minutes as well, of course, on behalf of your residents. Uh, but I just caution you, we are supposed to keep it to five minutes at Council uh, ourselves. So yep. go ahead. Definitely, Mayor Lehman. I just wanted to quickly show some slides that obviously show the area. It's a very low residential uh, or low density area. Um, and next slide, please. And then as you uh, look at the subject lands uh, from the rear, from the red fern side, which is obviously uh, lined in red. Next slide, please. And when you look at the subject lands from the uh, south side or the north side facing south, um, you can see where the, uh, the height and the density is an issue with the residents in the neighborhood. Next slide, please. This is a Google Street View when you uh, are standing uh, at one end of the subject lands uh, facing west or east, I should say, towards uh, Essa Road. Uh, as you can see on one side of the road, it's all uh, the fences of backyards and on the other side, uh, it's uh, a series of bungalows. Next slide, please. And then as you're looking to the west, it's a, a very similar thing on the north side of the road. It's all the fences from the backyards and bungalows uh, on the opposite side. And then there's actually a bit of a gap before you get to uh, the two story towns further up the road. Next slide, please. And again, I know uh, Mr. Vela didn't like my, uh, my images. Uh, however, uh, I, I will stand by the accuracy that they, uh, that they do portray. Um, and the big, the big thing with this with my residents is the, the height and the density. That's the one issue that has uh, been the sticking point in this and, it's, and it really comes down to the front units at four and a half stories. Ideally, the residents would like to see the rear at two. Um, however, even under R1, it does permit up to 10 meters being built. Next slide, please. And again, just to show the, uh, the other three story building, I know there was reference to the peak on that one building. However, one little section of a peak reaching uh, 12 meters uh, doesn't negate that as being a 12 meter building in my opinion. Next slide, please. And as I've mentioned before, there are ways to build three story uh, stack towns. And this is a prime example of it out on Essa Road. And I believe that's my last slide. Great, thank you. Uh, members of council, as I've said in the past, and as you can see from the slides, this is a low density area in our city and the subject lands have the lowest density in levels in the area with only five units on the subject lands. The applicant has come forward with a request for an RM2 medium density zoning request. However, their application is for high density at 72 units per hectare. Their application also has front blocks at 12 and a half meters Although somehow tonight uh, it was presented as 12 meters, so I'm not quite sure where half a meter disappeared. Uh, and the units are at four and a half stories with rooftop patios, whereas RM2 per permits 10 meters at three stories. This being in an area that is co compromised uh, predominantly of bungalows along Maple View, four and a half stories with rooftop patios just do not integrate with the existing makeup of the community. The current plan only has five visitor spots with one being designated for handicap uh, for the 46 units. By lowering the density, this could also allow for less units at the rear, which would then afford seven to eight more visitor parking spots and would also serve as a temporary snow storage area, whereas the current plan has very limited space for this. The example provided tonight uh, by the applicant's planner of a previously approved development in Ward 6 is not an apples to apples, oranges to oranges comparison to this application. The homes that will back onto that townhouse complex on uh, Montessoran Street are yet to be constructed as the three homes in the slide currently don't exist. And the images portrayed in the bottom right of the slide are homes that are further down the road. 
Plus the homes in the area are all two story and not bungalows as is the case on Maple View. That development spoken of is comprised of three story towns and not four and a half stories as is proposed in this case and is also MU2 zoned and not R1. I'm just not seeing the similarities between the two. Maple View is not an intensification corridor, whereas section 4.2.2.3 sub B of the city's official plan states that medium density and high density development shall occur on intensification corridors and nodes. Maple View nor the intersection of Maple View and Essa is neither. Also in the official plan, section 4.2.2.2 sub D uh, sets that a medium density development maximum target at 53 units per hectare for street townhousing, whereas this application is on an, not on an intensification corridor and the application is requesting 72 units per hectare. I think we can all agree that we want something built on these lands, especially with one of the homes now being vacant and boarded up. However, we can't do this at all costs to our community as we should be promoting and approving smart intensification and not over intensification. These type of height and density targets can easily be achieved in other areas of the city like the Hewitts and secondary plans without having a negative impact on our existing communities. A development at this height and density is far more suited for an intensification corridor and would then meet the requirements of the city's official plan. Part of the amendment includes placing a hold on the zoning bylaw until a revised application is received to allow for some flexibility in the zoning bylaw at the time of its approval. Whereas without that provision at a later date, special provisions could not be added to the zoning bylaw. This amendment is a good compromise for an updated application that will integrate far better with the community and will be welcomed into the area by the residents opposed to in its current form. Those are my comments, Mayor Lehman. Okay, thanks, Councillor Harvey. Uh, comments on the amendment that's on the floor. Councillor Natalie Harris. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Uh, I just wanted to say I'm um, in favor of everything that Councillor Harvey has presented. And I also concur with the inaccurate comparisons with the uh, proposed site at Montserrat. Um, I think he's, Councillor Harvey's really put a lot of work into this and come forward with a good compromise. Um, so, uh, I just want to thank him and staff for really working hard on this and listening to the residents and um, I'm in support. Thanks, Councillor Harris. Councillor Reepman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I'm going to also support the uh, amendment as uh, proposed by Councillor Harvey. Um, I think that the question that we have wrestled with here um, is the whole question of fit. Does this proposal fit into this neighborhood. Um, and the official plan talks about that. It talks about integration into the neighborhoods um, and uh, that we have to be careful in terms of the character of the area. And I think that uh, the proposal that has been put forward, um, it doesn't fit the character. It's it's just out of step with what um, is hap has happened in that, in that community. Um, and I think that's uh, really where the rubber hits the road. And I listened very carefully to uh, Mr. Bella's uh, submission, and I, I noticed that he skipped over um, the character question. Um, it was just his opinion that it fit. Well, um, when you have concerns expressed uh, the way that the concerns have been expressed here, that's not a question to skip over. That's a question to come head to head with, and I, I don't think that he did. And I, uh, I certainly can't um, get myself to agree that it meets the character test in the official plan. So uh, I'm going to support the amendment. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Ritma. Others wish to speak to the amendment? Okay, uh, oh, all right, Councillor Allen. Sorry, Mary Lehman, I was digging out my card. Uh, from my desk. Um, okay, yeah, I have a few things to say about this. First of all, I want to thank all the, the residents who attended uh, and engaged in the meeting. Um, I know it's not easy to stand up at City Council and take a stand on something you believe in, so kudos to all of you. Um, 
I won't be supporting this amendment. I actually would have supported the original proposal uh, staff recommendation that came forward. And here's why. We are facing a, a climate crisis. We're facing a housing crisis. Um, and that means two things. We need housing and we need to ensure that new housing creates walkable, uh, livable, complete communities. And we need to stop suburban sprawl. Um, I heard residents today talk about what they'll have to live with uh, after the developer finishes the project, and I totally understand that concern and worry. But what I think residents will have to live with um, if this proposal goes ahead is new neighbors, new young families moving into the neighborhood, uh, new friends, a more walkable and livable community. Um, this is gentle density. Um, we are seeing proposals across the city, um, 40 stories, 30 stories, 20 stories, 15 stories, 10 stories. Um, this is gentle density. This is the missing middle that we talk so much about when it comes to affordable housing. Um, this is the type of development that we need. And I understand that residents aren't ha happy about changing their neighborhood, but density has to go somewhere and it needs to be spread equitably throughout the city. Uh, and I can tell you there are a lot of residents in Ward 2 who aren't happy with all the new proposals going in, uh, the 30 story, the 40 story towers. Um, and I understand and respect that, um, but we're growing as a city and we need to grow sustainably. So I'm hoping that we can spread that development and that density across the city equitably and create walkable communities everywhere. So that's why I won't support the amendments today. Thanks, Councillor Owen. Others wish to comment. Deputy Mayor Ward. Um, thank you, Mayor Lehman. I wasn't going to comment, but I just thought I have to point out that I think we have a, a duty to not maybe not protect residents from any development, but we have to make sure that they there is the least minimal the, the minimal impact on their neighbors. And I think in this case, there's just in my mind way too much. First of all, we aren't we are encouraging den intensification. This is uh, where the five homes are now. We're even with Councillor Harvey's amendment, we're talking about 34 units. So it's almost a 600% increase in the density of the site. So it's not like we're not increasing the density, but I think there is a limit. We're all gonna be facing, as you mentioned, we're all gonna be facing this kind of an infill project around our wards. And I think it's important for us as a council to say, yeah, we do have limits. You're not gonna be able to build every single thing you want. And the biggest one, the biggest concern for me is the height. I think that four and a half stories, when the, when the zoning, even the proposed zoning only allows a three story, I think there are concerns. I think a four and a half story, and I know it's a, rooftop patios, but even then there will be a effect on the neighbors. Those people will be looking down on them, even the people across the street. Um, I'm less concerned about the density. I, I'd be able to live with, I know this would allow about 34 units and I could live with more density on the site. And maybe when it comes back, there will be an increase in density, but I think we have to put limits on it. I think the idea of allowing, you know, just allowing the developers to put on any, any kind of any number of units they want because we're facing a housing crisis in Barry is wrong. We do have to set some kind of limits on what is going to be allowed because it's going to be coming to the entire city. And I don't think we can just let developers say, yes, we're, we can, it's, it's because we have a housing crisis, you have to approve this. I think we have to tell them there are limits. That's it. Thanks. Thanks, Deputy Mayor Ward. Uh, others who wish to comment? Okay, if not, uh, a couple of things. Um, a couple of questions, I guess, of staff. Uh, so Ms. Banfield, under RM2, if this amendment were to pass, uh, what would be the maximum height permitted versus um, what is uh, being, what was approved in the staff report, recommended in the staff report for approval? Uh, Mayor Lehman, the, the permitted, maximum permitted height in the RM2 zone is 10 meters. And um, I believe the recommendation in the staff report was 12.5 meters for those units on that front onto Mapleview. Okay. And uh, the density piece um, in, not in terms of the, uh, the density per hectare, but the actual difference in the number of units. Uh, I think I just heard Deputy uh, Mayor Ward say 34 as opposed to 46. Is that the difference we're talking about here between the amendment and the what was recommended uh, in the staff report? Mayor Lehman, yes, that's the difference. So 12 units. Okay. Um, it's a bit unfortunate we're, we're here. Uh, and I guess my 
my reasons um, are that uh, you know it when we took a look or when we were given the um, rundown on uh, the amendments that uh, or the special provisions that the developer is supportive of and those that they're opposed to. Uh, boy, it doesn't seem like uh, this, the ward councillor and the developer are too far apart or the community and the developer are too far apart anymore. Um, and my real concern here is uh, while the, the critical issue of height and density um, remains some distance apart, nowhere near as far apart as it was before, uh, if we turn this down, um, you know, there's all, I, I think the risk is very real that because we're beyond the decision timeline, uh, LPAT will decide this for the residents, not Barry City Council. I never like to see that outcome. I always prefer to see uh, a local solution and a local decision. Uh, and I, you know, I don't know that. And I'm, I was actually glad that we haven't received the lawyer letter that <laughs> we sometimes receive at this point in the process. So who knows? Uh, what the outcome of, of this amendment may be. Um, I certainly understand the central point on this, and I spoke to this when the, when the matter was first in front of planning committee, that um, I think we have struggled in this city with receiving a lot of applications that have been outside of intensification corridors, uh, which Ms. Foster is correct. We must evaluate on their merit and individually, uh, based, but based on policy that are in our official plan, and that's policy that council approved and has applied in about a dozen other circumstances similar to this one. And I understand there may be um, uh, quibbles with the examples uh, that uh, Mr. Vella showed or, or didn't show. Uh, but when this first came up, I did look at a number of other comparable situations. I agree Hamner's not particularly comparable, um, but we have certainly approved more density than this in very comparable circumstances. And I think that creates a challenge because council must try and deal with all of these issues consistently. Um, so I struggle, I struggle with that, um, although the point that it is outside the quarter, it is. And frankly, in our new official plan, I'm looking for policy that strengthens protections against development outside of the intensification corridors beyond very, very gentle uh, infiller intensification. Uh, and I think the missing middle has lots of opportunities in, in our city. Um, and we'll have within the new official plan. And frankly, sites like this, I would prefer to see um, uh, uh, be more consistent with the surrounding neighborhood. Uh, that being said, I am gonna vote against the amendment for three reasons. Um, number one is I can't justify our position on previous similar applications, which permitted more height and density uh, and then vote no to this one. Um, Secondly, uh, paragraphs two and three are nothing but red tape. And with great respect uh, to the mover uh, and staff who probably assisted with the language and the steps, I do not agree with adding a holding provision and a bump up for the site plan to council. Uh, a housing crisis means we should not be adding additional layers of approval and red tape, just the opposite. We are being challenged by everybody from advocates to the minister himself and the Ford government to reduce these kinds of barriers. And so I can't support paragraphs two and three of the motion as well. Uh, I really struggle with this because, um, you know, I think the core, I think, first of all, I should have said off the outset and I'll say, I guess, in conclusion, um, I really appreciated the residents approach to this. I appreciated deputations tonight that weren't focused on attributing motives to the developer or anything other than that. Uh, residents came forward and said, here's what's really important to us, uh, presented that in a very thoughtful way. Um, uh, I, I think my challenge with it is, and when we sit in these chairs, we're required to be uh, both uh, cognizant of the needs of the whole city. And there's no question here that the difference between yes and no on the amendment is 12 fairly affordable family uh, units. And uh, I just don't see the 12 additional cars or the 15 additional cars that would result from those additional units um, being so much of an impact on the neighborhood. And, and you know, I think in viewing the design, while I understand the concern about the extra um, uh, eight feet of height, uh, it's it to me on balance, we still have a um, responsibility uh, to the, the overall housing situation in the city. So I'm gonna vote against the amendment, but I, I wanna tell the residents, including those that I had a chance to speak to on the phone and otherwise, um, that I really appreciated their approach to this. And I think it's a shame we're here because 
um, you know, we're about three or four clauses away from agreement. And I fear uh, the decision is now going to be taken out of all of our hands. I hope that's not the case. So I'll call the question on the amendment. Those in favor of the amendment. Recorded vote, please. Madam Clerk, go ahead and conduct the vote. Uh, thank you, Mayor Lehman. I'm going to start with Councillor Natalie Harris. Yes. Councillor Rima. Yes. Deputy Mayor Ward. Yes. Councillor Congo. Yes. Councillor Jim Harris. Yes. Uh, Councillor Harvey. Yes. Uh, Councillor Aylwin. No. Councillor McCann. Uh, yes, thank you. Mayor Lehman. No. Councillor Thompson. Yes. And Councillor Morales. No. Motion carries. Okay, uh, thank you very much. The amendment carries. And on the main motion as amended, any further comments, members of council? Okay, seeing none, I'll call the question on the main motion. Oh, sorry, Councillor Harvey, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Lehman. I just wanted to close out uh, saying, I, I think this is a, a good compromise. I know not, obviously there's a few people around this table that might think otherwise, but um, I, I think this gives them a, a new starting point. Uh, like you, you had mentioned, Mayor Lehman, uh, I, I think both sides are fairly close on this. Um, and uh, I would hope that, uh, like, I mean, again, the height and the density is not everything. It was predominantly the height. Uh, and I would hope that uh, we see something come back that uh, might be a little more palatable uh, and, uh, and everybody can move on. Uh, in the end, I, I would imagine nobody's going to walk away thinking they've won this uh, and there's got to be concessions on both sides. So that's, that's what I'm hoping for with this. Uh, and I thank those members of council that did uh, vote in favor of the amendment. Okay, thanks, Councillor Harvey. I'll call the question unless there are any other comments. Seeing none on the main motion as amended. Those in favor, please indicate. And opposed, one, that carries. Okay, uh, moving on then, uh, we are on section C. No, sorry, we're on to the general committee report, Deputy Mayor Ward, I think. Go ahead. Yep, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that section A of the first general committee report dated January 24th, 2022, as circulated be received. Thank you, it's moved by Deputy Mayor Ward, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that section A of the first general committee report dated January 24th, as circulated be received. It's to receive uh, the confidential potential acquisition of property matter related to the housing task force, confidential potential disposition of property matter at Little Lake, and the confidential potential disposition of property matter on Worsley Street. Uh, it's just to receive those discussions, uh, comments, or questions. No, call the question. Those in favor of section A? Anybody opposed? None. That is received. Section B, please. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that Section B of the first general committee report dated January 24, 2022, be adopted. Thank you. It's moved by Deputy Mayor Ward, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that Section B of the first general committee report dated January 24, 2022, be adopted. These are the Housing Task Force uh, recommendations out of uh, the uh, January 24th meeting. Comments or questions? Okay, seeing none, I'll call the question. All right, recorded vote has been requested by Councillor Morales. Madam Clerk, please conduct the vote. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. I will start with Councillor Natalie Harris. Yes. Councillor Rima. Yes. Deputy Mayor Ward. Yes. Councillor Congo. Yes. Councillor Jim Harris. Yes. Councillor Harvey. Yes. Councillor Aylwin. Yes. Councillor McCann. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mayor Lehman. Yes. Uh, Councillor Thompson. Yes. And Councillor Morales. Yes. Uh, mo uh, motion carries unanimously. 
Thank you very much, uh, members of council and Madam Clerk. And yeah, I better vote for it. I was chairing the task force. <laughs> Section C, please. Uh, Move by myself, seconded by Councillor Thompson. Section C of the first general committee report dated January 24, 2022 be adopted. Thank you. It's moved by Deputy Mayor Ward, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that Section C of the first general committee report dated January 24th, 2022 be adopted. This is with regards to the Barry Area Native Advisory Circles Indigenous Health Centre. Comments or questions on Section C? Seeing none, those in favour of Section C, please indicate. Any opposed? None. That carries. Thank you very much. Members of Council, Section D, please. Moved by myself, second by Councillor Thompson, that Section D of the First General Committee report dated January 24th, 2022 be adopted. Thank you. It's moved by Deputy Mayor Ward, second by Councillor Thompson, that Section D of the First General Committee report dated February 24th, 2022 be adopted. This is regards to the potential disposition of property matter with the YMCA of Simcoe Muskoka. Comments or questions? Councillor McCann. Uh, thank you, Mary Lehman. I do have an amendment. Okay, I think it's been circulated to uh, the rest of council. It's gonna be uh, put up by myself and second by uh, Councillor Harvey. That motion 22G013 of section C of the first general committee reported dated January 24th, 2022 be amended by adding the following paragraph. Number four, that the YMCA come back with a solid plan with the city of Barrie to connect the library and the YMCA to be a safe, warm, to be safe, warm and enclosed. Okay, we have an amendment. It's moved by Councillor McCann and seconded by Councillor Harvey that motion 22G13 of section C of the first general committee report dated January 24th, 2022 be amended by adding the following paragraph number four that the YMCA come back with a solid plan with the city of Barrie to connect the library and the YMCA to be safe, warm, and enclosed. Uh, Councillor McCann. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Lehman. You know, after uh, last uh, week's um, discussion on the YMCA, I've done a lot of processing and, uh, and I feel very strongly about uh, this amendment. So I hope I get council support. And uh, basically uh, I'm excited for the Y to come downtown for many reasons. Uh, and I think that uh, we've got one shot to make this a great building, uh, a great culture, uh, a great uh, addition to the downtown. And what I want to do is actually have the YMCA come back and actually, I'd like to see the YMCA and the library get married. I wanna see them attached by a uh, connection corridor. Uh, and so um, what I'm looking to do is, uh, I actually took a little few minutes and I want to look at this project through parents' eyes and maybe not directly through a counselor's eyes. And I thought, what would a parent actually want to see at the YMCA? And I think the parents uh, or parents would actually like to see something that is safer and something that is convenient. Uh, we've got two great organizations, Barry Public Library, and we've got the YMCA. Both of them have uh, great um, uh, programs. And quite frankly, if you've got a single parent or you've got you know, two parents with multiple kids going to the YMCA, it may be tricky and may be difficult having kids going to swimming lessons and having other students that were other stu uh, sorry, kids that want to maybe go uh, meet friends at the library, uh, do a project, do homework. And I wanna give the kids and the parents a safe and convenient corridor that'll connect both buildings. So that's one and two, safe and convenient. And number three, it's about building a great community hub. I think as a counselor, it's our job to build community hubs and to uh, integrate both buildings so we can have a aesthetically pleasing uh, area where the corridor connects both uh, the YMCA and the library, and uh, it can actually be have great curb appeal. So tonight I'm asking for council to support this amendment. Uh, I'm not asking for any money. I'm just asking for additional uh, detail from the YMCA. I have spoken to the YMCA. I've spoken to uh, members of the city of Barrie, and uh, quite frankly, it all seems like great ideas, but we need to know how much it costs and we need to know the logistics. So therefore, that's information I want to come back. So I'd appreciate your support and I'm happy to answer any questions, Mary Lehman. Okay, uh, thank you, 
Councillor McCann, uh, Councillor Aylwin, comment. Thank you, Mayor Liebman. <clears throat> and thank you, Councillor McCann, uh, for bringing this motion forward. Uh, as one of the two members of council on the Barry Public Library Board, um, it's good to see, and I can tell you we're way ahead of you. Uh, we just had our board meeting um, last week, and uh, we, our CEO, uh, Lauren Jessup, has been in conversation with the YMCA for months now, um, planning how cross-programming can happen and uh, how we can connect uh, the two buildings uh, from that corridor that uh, is currently John Coop Park. So we had an in-depth discussion about it. Our master facilities plan at the public library actually includes some improvements for the downtown library that would facilitate um, a better pedestrian access between the buildings. So uh, I think we're on the right track with this one and uh, I will be supportive of this. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor Owen. Councillor Harvey. Thanks, Mayor Lehman. Yeah, I was uh, happy to support this. I know we had a little bit of a discussion when uh, when Councillor McCann brought this uh, forward uh, at our last meeting. Um, and I guess when you think about it too, our future community centers in the Hewitts and the Salem areas are planned to have libraries connected to them. Um, so this is very much in line with these two new community centers uh, as our city grows. Um, so I think this would be a great opportunity uh, for uh, the two organizations to uh, have a look to see how the, the two can connect together. Um, and now's the time to do it, opposed to trying to do it after construction and uh, potentially making it look like some patchwork. So I do applaud uh, Councillor McCann for bringing this forward because uh, it does have a great segue between the two organizations. Any other comments on the amendment? Councillor Morello. Thank you, Mary Lehman. Um, I just want to say I'll be supportive of it. Um, I, again, I think the, the groundwork has been laid down as uh, Councillor Alwyn um, explained has been laid down for a while, but uh, this motion is, it's not frivolous. It's, uh, you can't, if it's coming from the city and it's coming from the library and uh, the YMCA is going to hear it loud and clear. Um, also, I think Councillor Alwyn's being a little bit humble uh, for the time we've been on the board together. He's been the one pushing to spend money on the outside of the libraries. Uh, he's uh, about re rehabilitating that kind of parking space, that community gathering space, obviously, because uh, a lot of people get either gather there for a couple minutes or maybe gather there for half the day. So he's really been the one pushing for that. So um, this, and which created a culture of understanding that. It's not just saying the common moving on. That got the board thinking about it because he's bringing it up always. Uh, it's usually around budget time, which moves the needle. And now that the YMC is coming to this dynamic, it's just a perfect synergy and timing for everybody. So I just wanted to um, uh, make that clear because uh, he might be humble, but I usually am not. So uh, on his behalf. Unsolicited on his be unsolicited on his behalf. So I'll be supportive of this and thank you, Councillor McCann, for the motion. Thanks, Councillor Morales. Uh, any other comments? No. Uh, oh, Councillor McCann. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Mayor Lehman, maybe just for the um, you know, for the benefit of, of team building on this uh, council. Uh, Council Aylwin, I actually uh, had no idea that uh, you were working on this project. If, if I did actually know that you were working. I definitely would have reached out and uh, and connected. So, um, you know, just want to publicly say that. And, and obviously, uh, I appreciate your support. And uh, let's build a great community hub. Thank you. Okay, I'll call the question. Those in favor of the amendment? All right, nobody opposed. That carries unanimously. Uh, and on the motion as amended, section D. Comments or questions? Seeing none, those in favor of section D as amended. Any opposed? None, that carries unanimously. Uh, Deputy Mayor Ward, I think we are at section A, the general, the second general committee report. Go ahead. Myself, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that Section A of the General Committee Second General Committee Report, dated January twenty fourth, two thousand twenty two, be adopted. Thank you. It's moved by Deputy Mayor Ward, seconded by Councillor Thompson. Section A of the General Committee Second General Committee Report, dated January twenty second, be adopted. This is the request of the province for the community reintegration officers for Central North Correctional Center. Councillor Congo, I believe, I have an amendment. I do. Thank you. Uh through you, Mayor Lehman, I'd like to 
table an amendment to 22G014. Uh, and um, that amendment being that a letter be sent to the Solicitor General of Ontario expressing the urgency to prioritize allocating dedicated community integration officers for the Central North Correction Centre to improve an individual's transition from custody to neighboring communities, facilitate linkages to support service, and reduce pressures on the Barry Area Sheltering and Outreach System. And I can speak to that. Uh, okay, go ahead. Oh. Yep, go ahead, Council. Go ahead. So uh, Council um, may see that this is a pretty um, small edit, but one that uh, I connected with um, Deputy Mayor Barry Ward on by email after the presentation by Ms. Chambers. So really the language there stays the same in the last paragraph, but it does um, heighten um, and give acknowledgement to there being some allocation of the resource to the Central North Correction Center. While we don't know, it's really asking for that center to have prioritization for when they actually push out the next wave of those resources. So just really bumping up the language there a little bit and asking that that center actually gets uh, prioritized um, with some urgency. Thanks very much, Councillor Kungle. Um, appreciate the amendment. And uh, I think members of council, um, you can see it's, it's really uh, the addition of a small uh, uh, but important um, dimension to our letter. Uh, any comments on the amendment? Okay, seeing none, I'll call the question on the amendment. Those in favor? Anybody opposed? None, that carries. Uh, any further comments or questions on section A? I'll just say, uh, having heard the deputation tonight uh, really does reinforce the importance of these uh, officers and the importance of discharge planning. And I know from speaking with our shelter operators, nothing funny about it, uh, discharge planning from healthcare system from the justice system is absolutely essential because uh, without it, um, it's our shelter system that has to uh, try and assist uh, on no notice and with few resources. So this, this uh, would certainly help. Uh, so we'll call the question. Those in favor of section A as amended. Is anyone opposed? None. That carries. Section B, please. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that section B of the second general committee report dated January, January 24th, 2022 be received. Moved by Deputy Mayor Ward, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that Section B of the general Second General Committee report, dated January 24th, 2022, be received. It's to receive the presentation that was made concerning the Performing Arts Center Task Force. Comments or questions on Section B? Councillor McCann. Thank you, Mary Lehman. Maybe just a quick question for maybe Don McAlpine or uh, Councillor Harris, just on timing. You know, uh, this getting approved tonight. Where can we um, see this coming back to this council or will be next council? Does Councillor um, uh, Harris or Don McAlpine have any, uh, any insight? I'll go to Councillor Harris. I think it was um, Ms. Schlichter who supported the task force, but uh, we'll go to Councillor Jim Harris first on timing, anticipated next steps. Yeah, thanks, Jim. I'm assuming this question is related more to the next item, but this is the presentation, yeah. correct? Yeah. So. Uh, with that noted, I, um, it's in this year's budget to start the work, the $200,000 to start um, the work, which is detailed in uh, the motion, which is coming up in um, section C. So um, I don't have that information exactly. I would assume that um, hopefully this can be done with council's approval uh, and get motion quickly, but I don't have the details on time, unfortunately, um, Councillor McCann. Um, Ms. Schlichter, if uh, you're on, are you able to speak to the next steps? Or Ms. McAlpine, for that matter. Ms. Schlichter. Heather, thank you for the question. Uh, Councillor McCann, um, we would expect uh, there would be a procurement process to bring the consultant on board. So we would expect the work would begin this year. Um, given the timing, it is likely that it would be uh, with the new council. Okay, thank you very much. 
Okay, so this is just to receive the presentation. Comments or questions? Any further? Seeing none, I'll call the question. Those in favor of section B? Any opposed? None, that carries. Section C, please. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that section C of the second general committee report dated January 24, 2022 be adopted. Thank you. It's moved by Deputy Mayor Ward, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that Section C of the Second General Committee report dated January 24th, 2022 be adopted. This is with regards to the Performing Arts Centre Task Force, uh, the motion from General Committee last week. Comments or questions on Section C? Seeing none, I'll ask for a recorded vote on Section C, please. Madam Clerk, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Marilyn. Lynn. I'm going to actually start with Councillor Morales. Yes. Uh, Councillor Thompson. Yes. Mayor Lehman. Yes. Councillor McCann. Absolutely. Councillor Aylwin. Yes. Councillor Harvey. Yes. Councillor Jim Harris. Yes. Uh, Councillor Kongo. Yes. Deputy Mayor Ward. Yes. Councillor Rima. Yes. And Councillor Natalie Harris. Yes. That motion carries. And I'll thank members of council for uh, the unanimous vote. I want to also recognize just at this point, uh, a big thank you to, again, all of the volunteer members of this task force uh, who put in a ton of work, a couple of subcommittees, uh, traveled, did research, uh, met between meetings, uh, and all under the uh, able support of Councillor Reepma and Councillor Thompson and the leadership of Councillor Jim Harris who chaired the task force. Thank you to everybody who was involved in this and uh, congratulations on a unanimous vote of support at council. All right, we'll move to, uh, well, there is no section D, so that completes, I think, the committee report. Stephanie Mayor Ward, does it not? It does, okay. Uh, the remaining item on tonight's agenda other than the inquiries, announcements, and bylaws that we do at the end is a presentation, and uh, it is last but certainly not least, and this is by the Barrie Police Service concerning the community safety, well-being, and harm-focused policing. So uh, our police chief, Kimberly Greenwood, is with us tonight to introduce the presentation. Chief Greenwood, welcome to City Council, as always. Uh, good evening, Mayor Lehman, Deputy ward and members of council and those joining us remotely. Uh, tonight, Deputy Chief Wiley Allen and Deputy Chief Rich Johnson will share information on the Barry Police Service well-being and safety initiatives and our focus on evidence-based policing. We have a presentation that we're just putting up for uh, council this evening. I'll pass it on to Deputy Allen. Thank you, Chief. Good evening. Community safety and well-being plans are about finding new ways for municipal and community partners to work together to achieve shared goals that reflect community priorities. <clears throat> community safety and well-being plans build off existing efforts and encourage new collaborations as a way to achieve more given the limits of available resources. Now that the plan has received council's endorsement, plan partners are beginning to work to implement identified actions with the support of the city. The province has legislated municipalities to develop and adopt community safety and well being plans. The Barry Police Service is one, one of 15 partners that help the city to develop the plan and has responsibilities to help implement specific action items. Within the Barry Police Service, we have a number of resources that work fully or partially on implementing action items under the community safety and well being plan or by contributing generally to improving community safety and well-being. To assist in implementing the action items assigned to the Barry Police Service, we have created the position of Community Safety and Well-Being Officer. Many of you will be familiar with Constable Kira Brooks. Hello, I'm Constable Kira Brooks with the Barry Police Service. I'm our Community Safety and Well-Being Officer. 
As a dedicated community safety and well-being officer, I'm focused on community engagement and advocating for alternative solutions for at-risk community members who are involved in low-level crimes. I'm excited that we have a brand new community safety and well-being team that is committed to our community. Constable Brooks is responsible for developing partnerships with community organizations, developing community engagement opportunities, and to work with downtown business owners to identify and address concerns. All of this is with the goal of improving general community safety and well being. Please know that Constable Brooks is not alone. She works alongside one of our community safety and well being teams, focusing on community engagement and social disorder. We'd like to share some successes of our community safety and well being unit. Constable Kara Brooks was involved in the Bright Spot program, which was launched after a community member expressed concerns about safety in the downtown area. Constable Brooks completed a safety audit and offered suggestions. As a result, a community partnership developed the Bright Spot campaign, as well as an initiative to light up downtown alleys. Further, our community safety and well being team that, that focuses on social disorder was able to make a number of significant arrests in relation to hundreds of graffiti tags throughout the city of Barrie. Five individuals were identified and held to account ultimately facing more than 100, 100 charges in total. This team has also been able to successfully collaborate and partner on other projects within the community. Next, Deputy Johnson will now speak for our other community safety and well-being team, which focus on high harm areas and how they are using evidence-based policing principles to more effectively deploy frontline resources to reduce harm. <clears throat> Thank you, Deputy Allen. The Barrie Police Service is operationalizing the Canadian Crime Severity Index to use our finite resources in a more effective and efficient way. We are pivoting. We are looking at the city through a different lens, one that takes into account the harm that crime causes. What do I mean by this? All crimes are not equal. A minor theft and a violent assault share one thing. They are both counted as crimes. But counting them as equal because they are both crimes misses the very real impact that they have on the victim and the broader community. Historically, police services have re reported primarily on crime counts. With harm-focused policing, we are treating responses to crime with greater attention to the harm it causes the victim and the broader community. While both the theft and the violent assault have a victim, and we are sensitive to what that may mean for the victim especially, the injury and fear that are created because of the violent physical assault is far greater than that of a minor theft. Our approach, while seeking to reduce total crime volume, is focusing on high harm. Research strongly supports this approach. The effectiveness of a police service in achieving its purpose as a public safety organization directly impacts the trust the community has in their police. This is a legitimacy building approach. Research also supports the methodology we're using. We know crime concentrates. It is most certainly not spread evenly over a geographic area. On this map, crime is mapped within the city of Barrie by volume. Note the different areas. Some have single tiles, others have towers or stacks. Think of these towers as hotspots. These reflect areas of concentration of numbers of individual crimes. On this map, is crime mapped by harm. The higher the stack, the greater the harm of the individual crimes. The different colors you are seeing are categories of crimes. This allows the police to better measure our impact. Some represent purely proactive enforced crime, others privately detected commercial crime. The dark blue is victim-based harm. We are able to focus, to target, specifically on those crimes and locations where the victim experienced the greatest harm. Note that between the two maps, there are a number of different areas of concentration. While evidence-based research explains that crime by volume concentrates, we're also, we also know that crime by harm is even more concentrated. Our CSWB teams are now deployed to proactively police in areas that are considered high harm hotspots. We are targeting high harm locations, testing evidence-based crime reduction strategies, and tracking the results to be better able to measure the impact we are having. To alleviate any fears or concerns, 
Frontline officers continue to respond to traditional calls for service, no matter the location, and if needed, CSWB teams will also respond. We recognize that this approach requires a balance. We aim to reduce crime harm while reducing crime volume. We are also looking to address social disorder that impacts our community. All this while recognizing that you, our community that we serve, want to see more of us. This is what operationalizing research looks like. I will let Sergeant Randy Fitzgerald tell you about what he does best. Sergeant Fitzgerald, I am the uh, Sergeant in the Community Safety and Wellbeing Unit. One of the dashboards I have is the uh, Crime Harm Index based on areas. So essentially what that is, is areas of the city that are experiencing the most harm, uh, either by um, high crime offenses or high harm crime offenses happening there, or multiple crimes, so volume. Uh, I look at the information and I deploy the officers to those areas at specific times in hopes to deter future crimes from happening. Constable Hudson Cormier is a member of our community safety and well-being team and explains how being deployed to a high harm hotspot can ensure officers are in the right place at the right time to improve safety in our city. My name is uh, Hudson Cormier. I've been with the Barry Police Service as a constable for uh, almost four years now. I'm uh, currently a part of the community safety and well-being team. 100% more proactive. Um, we definitely get to see the areas of the town that we need to attend to because they're, you know, showing that they're a hot spot. We're targeting certain times in certain areas um, and we're making more of an impact for sure. We've taken our data and are using it far more effectively. The CSWB team's approach is strategic, targeted and researched. We want to make the best use of our limited resources. We're focusing our CSWB teams where they can have the most impact in areas of high harm and high crime volume. We are also addressing social disorder. We are tracking harm levels to evaluate our effectiveness. This is about reducing the harm of crime and the number of crimes committed, while also recognizing the impact of social disorder. We are effectively deploying our resources where they are needed most. As always, you can reference our strategic plan or our annual reports online for more information about our initiatives and results, including from our annual community safety survey. Both Deputy Allen and I thank you for your time, as well as the chief, and invite any questions you may have. Okay, Deputies Allen and Johnson, uh, Chief Greenwood, thank you very much for the presentation and uh, the graphics, which frankly show our city quite differently when you look at it through a little bit of a different lens. Uh, thank you very much for this. Uh, I'm sure there are some questions. I already saw a few placards. I think Councillor Natalie Harris, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, at one point you spoke of seeing you more, which is obviously something we definitely hear as uh, ward councillors. And we reach out to you and, and, and kind of share what uh, our concerns are within each ward. But um, this is kind of a broad question. And um, I was hoping if you, if you can't answer it here, I can uh, answer, I can talk to you offline, but are there any discussions within uh, the Barry Police Service about um, following in the footsteps of the Toronto Board of Health with decriminalization of drugs? which would then allow our officers to focus uh, more on those higher violent crimes? Thank you for the uh, question, Councillor Harris. Um, the Barry Police Service has to follow the laws as, as they are written, and we, um, we are uh, sworn to, to follow the law that there is. Uh, that's there. Uh, when it comes to decriminalization of drugs, there are positions put out by a uh, number of uh, social agencies, community, uh, uh, different levels of, of government, as well as the uh, CACP, the Canadian Chief Association of Chiefs of Police, and the Ontario Association of Chiefs of Police. So while we wait uh, further direction, um, those, uh, those things will happen. And, and uh, perhaps there's an opportunity for the discussion on this further down the road, uh, but the time is too early to, to make any commitment of that sort. Okay, yeah, just a quick follow-up. Yeah, absolutely, I, I definitely wasn't looking for commitment in any way. Um, yeah, I, would, I really welcome 
having a conversation with you at, at your uh, convenience as well. And yeah, it, it's definitely a, a topic that is important. And it just really, Sean, I didn't even think about asking this question, to be honest, until you said seeing you more, uh, seeing more of you. And that really uh, is evidence-based uh, policing, like you are speaking of as well, that uh, if we can decriminalize drugs, then we can uh, see our officers who are trained on so many other levels um, to take care of our city in other ways. So thank you for your comments. Thank you, Councillor Harris. Uh, Councillor Kungle. Thank you, uh, through you, Mayor Lehman, to Chief Greenwood um, and uh, the rest of the team. Thank you for the presentation. I do have about three questions. Um, and I want to start off by saying um, thank you for highlighting the, the role in the task force. We're still trying to get that messaging out to the public because uh, we've seen Constable Kira Brooks um, in Ward 3, for example, and she's done some direct engagement um, to help identify um, areas of concern that residents have raised. And um, I know there's a lot of new information that um, has come about that she was able to share with residents on the importance of um, sharing, you know, calling the non-emergency line and also using the new online reporting tool. I didn't know if you could share a little bit more about how important it is for residents to be engaging with you in some way to help identify times of day, days of the week, where they're seeing something happen that allows you to target um, some of the uh, the officers with that task force. So I was hoping you could speak to what I'm seeing as some new online reporting um, resources. Councilor Kungle, thank you for your question. Uh, yes, uh, Constable Brooks is doing a great job out there with the community engagement, working with her, her team um, to get information from the community uh, so we can better uh, serve the, the members of the community. Um, there are a number of ways for the community to engage. One thing that we would love to see is more engagement uh, with the community safety survey that uh, Deputy Johnson spoke about in his presentation. And, and if we uh, had elevated numbers in that, it certainly gives us a robust picture of, of what people are feeling out there. And um, we're always trying to pass that message off to, to, um, to engage in that survey and, and any other, uh, other means. I, uh, to your point of uh, online reporting, uh, <clears throat> if we can drive uh, some of the low harm crimes towards uh, online reporting. It's, it's better for the community, allows us to serve. Uh, I can assure council and the community that uh, even the online uh, reporting gets the attention it's deserving of for investigations. And we have officers that go through that and, and, and follow up with the community as well. So um, as Deputy Johnson said, our resources are finite and we need to do a better job with what we have. The online reporting is a great tool uh, for us to, to do that, as well as the other online services that we offer. Thank you. In follow-up, if I may. So in addition to the online reporting tool, uh, I know some of our residents uh, in my ward uh, have security cameras, but weren't aware that they could actually register them with Barry police. And sometimes I'm actually seeing residents sharing recordings of whether it's, you know, someone looking for change in a car that's been left unlocked or, you know, individuals um, that might be kind of um, in the neighborhood um, that that's being shared on community platforms uh, and on social media, but maybe not being directly connected to police. Can you share any information about how those cameras are registered and how that information is used or if that uh, is beneficial around um, being able to respond in time. Uh, certainly, thank you, Councillor Kungle. Yes, so uh, as Deputy Allen spoken um, about those online tools on our, uh, on our website, you can register your camera. Again, it doesn't give us access, it just lets us know it's there and we would then reach out to you if there's crimes reported in the area. I just want to take you back for a second to your previous question, which was excellent, but please understand, as we are a finite resource, everything we spoke of today was about, or I spoke of, was about reported crime. I'm under no illusion that we capture all crime. In fact, we call it the iceberg effect. So much crime happens that we're unaware of. And to your point, um, if citizens are finding uh, low harm or low level crimes occurring, please report them online. It gives us a better picture of date, time, location. We have those finite resources and we can target them better if we know what's going on. And so it's, it's not us, uh, police and the community, it's the police that is the community and we're working together. Thank you. And if I, I may, you might have just provided a, a lovely segue into my uh, final question. 
We are, I am seeing some of the signage popping up around Neighborhood Watch. I mean, I remember as a kid um, having the signs in the windows, uh, you know, as a safe place to go. Uh, so are you seeing residents um, actually getting more engaged around Neighborhood Watch? I'm also hearing that those are programs that actually support some seniors uh, initiatives around if you um, identify an individual who may be wandering in the community. Um, so I was wondering if there is a new push or opportunity when we talk about partners with police in community and community safety, is that something that we could be promoting more or taking more advantage of with residents? And how does that fit with some of the new initiatives you've been doing? I believe it's Citizens on Patrol. So I know I'm getting lots of questions around um, knowing there was a great application process, you had some response. Are we seeing those individuals now in our communities and neighborhoods and how do they interact with residents? Thank you, Councillor Kungel, for that question. Yeah, that's a, that's a, a lot of information. I'll, I'll try to capture and touch on it all. Um, I want to start at the end where you talked about our volunteers, our COPS program, and even our, our auxiliary uh, program. Uh, our volunteers are our best ambassadors within the community to get the word out there, offer perspective, and, and pass the word around uh, on how much value the community brings to the work that we do, as Deputy Johnson just spoke about, and, and letting us know what the real, the real picture is out there. Um, everybody's seen our auxiliary officers. They're, they're dressed generally in a, in a uniform similar to ours, and they provide uh, a number of functions to, to assist with us through the uh, different um, operations that we would have in the city. Our COPS volunteers that you speak of, uh, a little bit of a different, um, a different group. Um, we have a, a robust group. We just actually uh, trained a number of new volunteers in the past, just before this last uh, COVID lockdown. And um, they can be seen, uh, last publicly seen, uh, walking the, um, the, the um, grounds on the tornado site, providing that just sense of security, sense of well-being, sense of confidence that someone's down there looking after uh, the, the site. Uh, they would direct any residents to any um, uh, professionals that are down at the area dealing with things uh, so people are, are informed properly. They are also uh, being considered to be in, uh, be used with some traffic safety initiatives that we are working and stay tuned for more on that in the, in the near future. Uh, but we're always looking ways for ways to uh, increase the robustness of the volunteers that, that serve the Barrie Police. As far as programs out in the community neighborhood watch, I also touched on Bright Spot, uh, which is a volunteer program similar to, to um, neighborhood watch in the downtown community. Um, we have um, uh, good uh, plans. I, um, I have to admit, I would have to follow up with you on uh, the neighborhood watch part and please feel free to reach out to me at any time. I know the Bright Spot campaign uh, with a, a certain amount of training uh, allows the store owners to, to volunteer for that program. And I think right now we have a list of 15 or 20 more uh, businesses downtown that want to participate in that. So there's, there's a, a, not a need, but there's also a desire to contribute to these programs to ensure their success. Great. Thank you. I have no further questions and do want to thank you for your presentation and your service. Our pleasure. Thank you very much, Councillor Kungel. Other questions from members of council? Councillor Jim Harris. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Lehman, and thank you, um, Jim Greenwood, and uh, the rest of the team for the presentation. I, I guess for me, it's it's really interesting. It, I guess it provides more questions than answers, to be honest. I, I, I'm just curious, as you look at the harm-focused policing and the examples you give, minor theft is low-harm crime, um, high harm crime is violent assault. Of those two types of crime, which is an easier one to deter based on having police officers actively patrolling? Because it would, it feels like some of the violent crime might be harder to uh, persuade than the smaller stuff like people breaking into cars and homes and those kind of things. Uh, thank you, Councillor Harris. Uh, so the challenge for us will be um, we are leveraging. Uh, research. And the issue we have is uh, debunked for a number of years and a number of decades is random patrol as an effective crime prevention tool. And it is a challenge for a lot of us because it's a comfort. And the reality is we can be more effective if we're far more targeted. Uh, we speak about um, low harm crime and it's not simply the occurrence of the crime, it's the effect on the, the individual victim and the broader community. 
And, and so the, the targeting of that higher harm crime is uh, for a more victim focused approach. Um, and, and appreciating your point, uh, certainly there are uh, a number of types of high harm crime that happen behind closed doors. We're, we are not, um, we're aware of that and, and that is the challenge going forward, but how we target that and how we uh, react to that, there are some crime, crime, crime reduction strategies we can attempt. Again, in a, and I'll give you an example in an apartment complex, uh, it, and it's not just the police. If we're aware of them, uh, if we're made aware of them, if, if it's reported, we can then uh, target that, the, that location. And it's not simply a police resource. Maybe we're bringing uh, partners with us. And I'm talking about um, our community partners in, in terms of wellness, uh, whether it's the, uh, the Women and Children's Shelter, uh, there's outreach communities. Uh, we heard from EFRI earlier. This is not a, uh, a police only approach. This is where we find out where uh, community well being is needed most in that high harm area. And the police are there to disrupt the crime triangle. And that's the, you know, the victim, uh, 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 an individual to commit the crime, and a lack of a capable guardian, that being the police or a citizen on patrol or an auxiliary or a landlord or a capable guardian, anyone in that property. And we're trying to disrupt that. Uh, and so um, it's not a simple solution because it's a complex problem. Yeah, thank you. And with that noted, how will you know this change, there's an improvement? Like what are the metrics that will be used to measure the improvement based on the changes? And that's an excellent question. So historically, we've just looked at volume and crime goes up, crime goes down. So you may have a number of thefts drop, you know, someone installs a new uh, uh, loss prevention program and and crime goes down in terms of numbers. When we talk about high harm, we talk about the values or the weights associated to those from the crime severity index. And, and so we can actually measure what crimes take place or reported to police in a certain location. And if we're seeing those values drop, and, and so um, in, in a, not a perfect world, but in a world where we're more effective, uh, we see harm, harm values drop year over year um, and, and uh, eventually decline we recognize it's going to occur at some level, but we minimize that and we minimize its impact on our victims. And so the idea being we set a standard, we see where we're at, and then we measure our effectiveness by how much we're reducing that, um, that uh, the weight of the crime or the crime harm. Yeah, thanks. I, I, I'm going to have to stop myself. So I, I get lots of questions, but I was thinking, you know, we've got these wonderful blocks, but we have no numbers on these blocks. I'm not even sure what an orange block is versus a pink block and a blue block on the chart. So, you know, the blocks are interesting, but I don't know if, if that big tall tower is a five or is it a 205? So it's, it's really hard. Anyway, so I'm going to, I think Mayor Lehman's going to jump in. I don't know. No, I'm going to jump in because I was going to ask about the same thing, uh, Jim. Oh, oh, and uh, okay. I'll, I'll actually ask uh, Deputy Johnson uh, if it's possible to put that side by side of the two maps up uh, because it is such uh, an enlightening uh, graphic all on one slide. If we can um, share the screen again with the police service and get that slide up with the colored blocks and maybe uh, Deputy Johnson, you could just walk us through that, um, those two images again. Certainly. Um, and so I, I hope you there appreciate we go. Perfect. Yes, that, oh, uh, that we're at such a, we're purposely at a high level here um, <laughs> because the closer you zoom in, uh, the smaller those tiles become in terms of uh, specific locations and addresses. So appreciating um, what that means, uh, I will draw your attention to uh, the all blue mapping and that's by volume. So a single tile is a single crime on the blue all blue map. The higher the stack, the multiple, like the number of crimes have occurred there. And so the higher the tower, the number of crimes, mm -hmm. not what type of crime. On, on your right with the colorful map, each of the colors represents a different type of crime. So I spoke to the dark blue. That is crimes against person. Um, as you're getting closer, the mapping actually changes where the higher towers, those are, uh, those are by um, the weight of the crime. So there may be orange in there, uh, yellow, uh, purple. So again, purple being, um, that's a, it's classified as other, so human trafficking, um, extortion. There, there are some, uh, not to get into too specific, but there are certain uh, crime types that, were, that are weighted. And so you'll see that, in terms of a finite resource, we're looking at areas uh, where they converge and they overlap. So if you want the most uh, effectiveness for your finite resources, the idea being when you want, lay one over the other and you find those locations which are in, uh, which are in sync and then you place resources at, at specific times uh, doing specific things, uh, it can reduce crime 
and reduce crime harm. And appreciating that is very separate than social disorder uh, and a complexity all to itself. So. So I'll ask a, maybe a question of interpretation I'll, and maybe it's yours too, Jim. Uh, so if we're looking at this map on the right, the height of the tower in total, is that the total harm to the community that we're seeing at that particular location? Okay, so mm -hmm. if we, you know, on the left, you could have equivalent height towers where you've got a hundred thefts and you've got a hundred assaults, even though the harm to the community is so much greater from 100 assaults. Well, it's probably a poor example, but let's go severe. Uh, you know, not that we have those locations, but 10 homicides versus 10 thefts. The towers on the left would be the same size. On the right, the homicide tower would be uh, so much higher and the, and the uh, 10 thefts would be that much lower. And, you know, when you look at the community that way, you say, are we sending our resources to the places where there's the greatest impact on the community from crime? not just the highest raw count. Have, have I got that about right? Uh, you do, Mayor. Uh, and, and to be uh, quite honest, if we zoomed uh, far closer in here, we zoomed right in, you would see a, a majority of the city of Barrie does not suffer crime at all. And I, and I just, I put that out there in terms of incredibly low to nil. Uh, and, and so it is not evenly spread. And so we do try to police that even spread. And there are some challenges with that. Uh, and uh, I would go back to Councillor Harris's question about, you know, the idea for an increased visibility. We know we need to be seen more uh, and, and there are strategies for that. But we also know that we want to make sure that we're in those uh, on the towers on the right in those areas. We want to see those towers drop. Uh, and that is a focus because that affects um, our that is for each. The height of those towers is the, the harm to our victims. Uh, and, and it has the a reverberating effect across our community. And that is an important factor we need to take into account and we need to target that far more effectively. Councillor Harris, you had the floor. Yeah, thank you, man. Yeah, I, I'm still, I mean, I appreciate the answers. I think it's still, the information is there, but it's left with lots of question marks. There's no numbers attached, no severity based on crime. What are the colors? So I, I appreciate the effort to use a evidence-based uh, model. I think that's great. Um, this may be a question as, as you gather evidence on the effectiveness of policing and policing um, based on severity index and data to um, um, you know, improve um, our community, how will that inform police volumes? That, as per se, I, I know one of the things we talk about is you know, there's no consistency as for how many police you have to have per capita, per 100,000 people, whatever. Is some of that evidence moving towards being able to make better quality decisions about how many police in a community should have per capita? Uh, so, Councillor Harris, fair question. I'm not going to project that down the road. Uh, certainly, uh, from my seat here, I I'm going to suggest that uh, given the finite resources that we have now, um, how do we more effectively use those? A and um, certainly, this is a reflection of a system used in the United Ki uh, Kingdom as a result of some austerity measures that occurred there. So, what we're looking at doing is just being far more effective with the finite resources we have currently. It seems like finite is the operative word for the for the night. I will say one quick question. You're talking about the UK. Are you moving towards uh, using less uh, force uh, with um, your model? So, for example, with a social disorder, will police officers be more like the Bobbies uh, that you reference? And from your UK uh, education, would you be seeing that type of policing um, more commonly used in in Ontario or Barrie? So, so Councillor Harris, to answer your your, your question, I, I would. Uh, Having been uh, back and forth a number of times, I'm gonna suggest that, um, and not bragging, but some the policing in Ontario is some of the best in the world. Um, and and it's, it's not about the tools on your belt, it's about the tools in your head. And our officers, um, the vast majority across this province uh, are excellent at de-escalation. Uh, and that's actually where it counts. I, to ignore the fact that we're bordered south of us to the most heavily armed nation in the world, um, would be uh, is not something I'm I'm going to venture toward. My suggestion in terms of policing, uh, our training is looking at um, policing our population and with our population with a procedural justice approach. And, and that is uh, there's a complexity to that, but it's certainly it's just dealing with it, people as we have in terms of treating them as human beings and and, and individuals that we come across in terms of our duties. So uh, I, I'm not suggesting that we're markedly moving away from 
uh, policing as we do today because the training in Ontario is some of the best in the world. I'll leave it at that, thanks. Thanks, Councillor Harris. Councillor Harvey. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Uh, I, I can see where obviously this data will be uh, very beneficial, especially when you look at it from a sector uh, policing model uh, when it comes to deploying your resources. Um, but my question is actually more from a proactive standpoint. Um, and I know recently I saw in the news where um, uh, the Barrie Police uh, have announced a new program, uh, the Inside Out program for youth uh, based out of the Holly Community Centre uh, that begins on February the 7th. I was just wondering if anybody is in a position to be able to speak a little bit uh, further about that program, because I do believe it does tie into community safety and well-being, but more from a proactive standpoint. Uh, thank you, Councillor Harvey. Uh, indeed, it is. It's very proactive. Uh, and in terms of a... Uh, uh, a public safety service, uh, we recognize that it's simply not, uh, our, our role is not law enforcement. It just, it can't be, uh, given the complexity of our society today. So when we look at something like the Inside Out program, that is actually built on evidence-based principles. Uh, it is, um, it, its involvement in police is so far as just the simple delivery. Uh, it's, um, the overt presence of police is minimal, minimal at best. Uh, it's based on looking at adverse childhood experiences and the, uh, the strong research supporting uh, looking at individuals who've experienced in that and giving them coping strategies and talking about the number one quality that has the potential to divert an individual who's experienced those or a number of them um, and equipping them with resilience and, and a strategy to potentially later on in life um, make different choices um, given the adverse uh, childhood experiences that they've had. And so uh, it is very proactive. Uh, it is um, completely evidence-based uh, in terms of its foundation and how it's being delivered. Great, thank you. And just uh, just one follow-up to that, because uh, I know my, some might look at this presentation as very enforcement-based, um, but I, I don't necessarily look at this as just enforcement-based. It's obviously to do with deploying your resources as effectively as you can, um, but I, I know on one slide there, I guess it was slide eight, where you spoke about uh, low, low harm crime versus high harm crime and uh, looking at, let's say, a minor theft in regards to a violent assault. Obviously, when those um, incidents are being investigated by the police, they may be treated differently. Uh, they may, especially the minor theft, uh, could be eligible for a diversion program. Um, would you be able to speak to that just to give residents a little bit of an understanding about the fact that uh, these different crimes are actually dealt with by the police and the justice system quite differently? Thank you, Councillor Harvey. Yes, and as a society, we look at that. Uh, and as the police, uh, we are part of the pre-charge diversion and we are, um, we're currently using that program as is the Crown's office. The reality is uh, when they're, uh, it's a low harm offense, we recognize um, that at the end of the day, what best serves the community, the individual, the victim, uh, and it's taking that all into account. But I, I'd be remiss if I didn't speak to the fact that the police, when they're investigating every single crime, are, uh, they're attuned to the victim. And simply because I said low harm crime, I don't want people to misunderstand that that means the victim, uh, their experience of the crime is low harm. Uh, some people like diamonds, they're extrinsically worth a lot of money. Um, my mom likes uh, garden gnomes. If you broke my mom's garden gnome, I'm going to suggest to you that means a lot more to her than a uh, piece of compressed coal that's turned into a shiny rock. It's, it's the experience of that crime. We're sensitive to that. And, and so we recognize that. But having said that, when, on a broader and a societal level, certainly um, uh, extreme violence um, is addressed by the police uh, differently than uh, relatively minor offenses. Great, thank you. And uh, I do uh, thank you all for your uh, great presentation. I look forward to seeing uh, what the results look like uh, down the road. Councillor Harvey, other questions for our deputy chiefs? Councillor Morales. Uh, thank you, Mayor Lehman. Uh, question to any of the uh, Barrier Police representatives. So I wanna start with, 
it leads to the question, but huge uh, kudos to Officer Brooks, or not just her, not just herself specifically, but also the existence of her position, um, what she's been able to do on social media, what she's been able to do on the streets. We're restoring that sense of when you're in danger, you run to the cops because you trust them, not you run away from the cops when they enter a space or a room. So it is baby steps, but that is exactly the culture shift uh, or redirection we need to do. As a result of that, um, are there any plans to have more of that visibility? I know there's been comments in the past that says um, more cops in the area don't necessarily make it more safe. If anything, it might create a perception that, wow, there's a lot of cops always in this area. Why? You know, is, is there some dangers? But what I'm hearing from um, residents who visit uh, more pedestrian areas, such as the uh, BIA perimeter, and what I'm hearing from actual BIA members themselves is that visibility helps. That, that officer checking in and uh, getting coffee and saying, hey, um, you know, how uh, is the owner still on vacation? How's the new uh, donut going? And, and having that relationship. Um, what I'm hearing is a little bit different from the comments of we don't maybe want them as visible. So I'm wondering what, uh, how we're resolving those two viewpoints. Um, sorry, how the Barry police is resolving those two. Thank you for the question, uh, Council, uh, Councillor Morales. Um, first of all, thank you for the compliments on the on the work of uh, our community safety officer, Kira Brooks. She is doing a fantastic job, um, tailor made, I think, for the position that, that we've created, and is uh, it's working really well um, to harmonize the community and, and the Barry Police. Um, as it relates to uh, community relationships uh, in the downtown and, and other uh, elsewhere. Um, as well as um, public uh, visibility uh, in these areas. Um, Kara and the community engagement team, which is part of the community safety well-being team, are working very hard to address the concerns of uh, the entire city. Uh, the downtown uh, certainly is one of them and, and efforts are being made and, and uh, we are aware of uh, meetings with the BIA um, to address some of those concerns and we will continue to address those concerns as we are able. Um, definitely, we want to have those relationships with not everybody uh, just downtown, but elsewhere in the community. We have a number of initiatives um, that might be wanted downtown, but are also wanted in our green spaces, are also wanted uh, behind the schools. And um, not to use the term, uh, Councillor Harris uh, spoke to the finite resources, but we just can't be everywhere at the same time. So it, we really... Uh, depend on those relationships you spoke of so that we can prioritize where our teams go and what kind of work they can do. And, and it really, really counts, the community engagement side of it really, really counts on the collaboration and the partnerships and the relationships that we build within the community, downtown or elsewhere, to have maximum effect so we are there at the right time, knowing um, what's outside of the norm and, and uh, deploying not just our own persons, but um, other collaborative resources and, and social and, and community networks within the community to address any of these problems. Still on mute, Sergio. Sorry, go ahead. Thank you for that response. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, to confirm what you said, um, uh, the BAI board passed a resolution to send a letter to the chief. The chief staff office has responded to me, I believe last week, and we're, we're in the midst of uh, scheduling that. So I look forward to that meeting. My final question is this. So um, an elephant in the room up here in the Northeast end of Barrie uh, is a specific student uh, off-campus student housing uh, building um, has seen, has been reported by the media. Uh, and I'm sure if we look at those metrics, I actually noticed that really tall tower in the back corner of the Northeast end. Uh, and so what can Barrie police do uh, when they start to see the concentration of crime, all types of crime? the concentration of, of assaults in specific areas, and there's a pattern to it. Um, there becomes like, oh, that's gonna be that area because I think anybody living in anywhere in Barrie, not just Northeast Enders, but start becoming concerned when an area starts becoming known as the area or the complex or the intersection, whatever you wanna call it, um, because this, these things don't happen overnight. It's a culture thing um, it's, and it's, uh, it's, it, it, it emerges. So now that it's been, I, I really wanna thank the media for that story that was done a couple of weeks ago, I believe by Barry today. Um, so what can Barry police do to get behind it, uh, sorry, get in front of it and prevent that from becoming a concentration of that area? And maybe maybe there's homework for council. Maybe what can council do? But um, I think uh, everybody wants to make sure 
that um, concentrations don't happen and we don't have any no-go areas, especially uh, in specific buildings where uh, parents, whether they're from Barrie or not, are entrusting their uh, 17, 18 year old, uh, uh, you know, sons and daughters to be uh, attending for post-secondary. Thank you, Councillor Morales. Um, this is going to be a bit of a two-pronged answer. I'm going to just start and, and talk about some of the engagement part, and I'm going to turn it over to Deputy Johnson, who will talk about um, the evidence and, and the, the layers of, of crime that you, you spoke to. So uh, this is a perfect example for our community engagement team to be part of that community. It wouldn't just be um, the tiles that you spoke about in the background that you saw on the picture, but how does this affect not just the, the, the population within the towers, but or in the buildings or the area, but the entire community. So that's a, an opportunity for our community engagement team to get out there, find out what's happening and work with, uh, with the community and, and any other agencies to uh, deter, uh, educate, uh, prevent anything um, that would uh, compound the problems um, that would lead to um, a, a more um, hard enforcement approach that um, uh, Deputy Johnson is going to speak to as it relates to the evidence and the reports that we're receiving. So, Councilor Morales, thank you. Uh, and, and just and just to clear up something there. So, when we speak about those towers, that is the reported crime. Uh, the intent of a public safety is uh, to to make ourselves more present and more visible there. And the idea being, um, it, it's not strictly uh, uh, law enforcement. The idea being is. Uh, we win the day as a community if we're there more often and those towers shrink. And I mean shrink mm -hmm. drastically, both in volume and harm. And, and, and so uh, the modeling that you see is the starting point. Uh, please understand that the Barry Police, uh, our intent is not to um, you know, uh, come in charging and it's, uh, it's about the, uh, that hard line approach. The idea is, is to reduce crime and, and to uh, our mere presence may actually uh, inhibit its occurrence in the first place. And the research supports that. If you see visible presence in air, uh, the police in areas, the likelihood of that crime occurring, some types of crime, is reduced. And that is our purpose. So when we're sending it, as Deputy Allen said, when we're sending in our uh, the community safety and well-being team, it's targeted for a, per a particular purpose. It's not simply to charge, it's, it's to be present. It's to engage people. We know the number one crime reduction strategy on the globe is collective efficacy. It's a community that's engaged with their, with their, uh, with their surrounding neighbors, with their, their businesses. They're talking to each other. That is the number one. That's the best police service in the world. Everyone in the community is part of it. That is where we'd love to be. But our attempt is to get in there and engage with people and see the towers uh, reduced. I don't want to say drop, reduced. <laughs> yeah, so, so let me just do a follow-up to that. Okay, great. So that's the goal. I think, yeah, I think we're all under the understanding that that's the goal. That's everybody's desire. What happens in the scenario where the property management company, the community, doesn't is not receptive to your strategies? Isn't isn't a isn't an active participant, right? Whenever you hear these scenarios, whether it's a private sector property management company, maybe sometimes it's a they say we're willing to work with the law, local law. You always hear that everybody's on the table. What happens when you get someone who either they're a, they're unaware? Of, no, they're not unaware. It, what happens if you get someone who's just unwilling to? have those conversations and therefore uh, it doesn't make your job as easy as to like, hey, like an officer is going to go there twice a week, do the rounds, run into people and have a presence at these hours. What if uh, they're not as receptive? Uh, not saying that's a scenario here, but it could become the scenario here. Again, these things don't happen overnight. This is an area doesn't become one of those areas overnight. So uh, at what point do you escalate your approach? And if you could approach it on a generic macro level, you don't have to to be about a specific site, but I'm curious as to that because that first point sounds great. And usually most people are willing to, that they, they, you know, as a community would love the help, right? If they know they're starting to become problematic, but uh, I'm wondering what happens when um, that's not the case. What do you guys do? So uh, I, I, I don't have a crystal ball, but I'm gonna to suggest to you that um, when we have those areas of um, uh, that uh, resist that police behavior, there are a number of things not just the police can do, but as a community. And so um, in, in terms of the, the uh, criminological research, we talked about focused deterrence. And that's not just the police, that may be the city and property and standards. That may be uh, um, Barry Fire and Emergency Services in terms of uh, looking at all the laws. That's the, the Crown Attorneys with respect to when the police do lay specific charges in there, uh, depending upon um, 
the uh, the surrounding context uh, what happens with those charges. It's not a simple. Uh, it, it wouldn't just be a simple answer that I could give you. And on a macro level, uh, Councillor, it, it is um, arguably you'd want to bring a, uh, a more um, a, a team approach uh, that requires a number of levels of um, government uh, as well as community services. Okay, perfect. Thank you for your time. Anyone else have questions? Councillor Kungel. Thank you. Um, through you, Mayor Lehman. Um, to Chief Greenwood and the and the team. So this might be one you can't answer, but one I'm keen to see about where we can carry the conversation. So when we talk about um, the lens of women and safety, and uh, in the media back in 2019, we saw that report talking about the best and worst places for women to live and Barry didn't do well. And across six key metrics, we uh, fell short considerably around health and personal security. And there are some interesting metrics under personal security, be it um, sexual assault, um, intimate partner violence, and other pieces. Knowing that sometimes um, when we look at the, the metrics, and these are dated, I think, back to 2017, um, are there metrics that we can look at that are more updated, that can reflect how individuals are engaging in reporting education about um, encouraging women um, to um, seek support, uh, understand what supports are there. Because sometimes when we look at data, um, it can be also skewed based on how we see um, whether or not women have reported or underreported and what is the actual picture of, of impact. I'm not sure if um, Barry Police is, is looking at that. And at some point in time, you know, is there a space and place to talk a bit about what we're seeing um, with more updated data on those metrics. Uh, thank you, Councillor Kungel. So as you said, it, it's less about the skewing of those statistics, but the challenge of them. Uh, and so we'll have a reported number of intimate partner violence events. Uh, and um, what the public may see is uh, year over year, uh, maybe it's stable, maybe it drops uh, and it dropped at the beginning of COVID. And uh, again, there was, well, that's a surprise. And, and what we said uh, at, from the outset is that's reported crime. <laughs> We're under no illusion that uh, there are uh, survivors behind locked doors and they're facing life challenges we can't even imagine. And we're not being reported to because there's no out for them. And we understand that. Uh, we recognize that there are other, um, other measures that we can take into account when we're actually looking at uh, those uh, rates of intimate partner violence. It may not necessarily be the police being reported to. Uh, the Women and Children's Shelter it, uh, receives, um, they, they get counts, uh, individuals get counseling there and you have to recognize that uh, perhaps uh, over time, uh, maybe there's a distrust in the police, maybe there's just, you know, there's just not that willingness to come forward. You may see in the future rates of intimate partner violence uh, reporting to police climb, but, and, and I caught the cautionary note is that may not be a bad thing if the reason why it's being reported is because there's increased transparency in the policing and, and there's a belief that we're going to be able to do something and we're out there and we're, we're actively doing things and there's a, a, a relationship building aspect to that. So as you said, it, it depends on the context. I guess in follow up to that, is there, um, you know, so we don't look at another report in another couple of years. I'm not sure the frequency of when this comes out using the same metrics, but is there a space where we can look at up-to-date data with a more perhaps review around all different places, referrals or contacts are being made to give a, a picture uh, of um, women's well-being uh, in the city of Barrie. Is that something that would potentially sit with a Barrie Health Accord or is that data being collected through partnerships, be it the shelters, the crisis centers and Barrie Police um, where we can actually look at getting information about, you know, what are we seeing uh, through COVID and then, and then in the coming years? Uh, thank you, Councillor Kungel. So uh, it, does it rest with the Barrie Police? Uh, no, and, and only that because we would have limited information. Does it sit with the Health Accord? Uh, maybe a far better vehicle to, to, to drive that forward. And I won't speak on behalf of the chief, but I think as the Barrie Police Service, uh, that may be a far better partnership. Reports to the hospital that we don't get reports to the, um, to the shelters and other community agency that, agencies that are there to support victims and survivors? Absolutely. Uh, is it possible? It, it, anything is possible. 
Um, we would certainly participate in so far as getting a more robust picture of what's going in our, on in our community and then uh, uh, taking our finite resources and uh, investing them where they need to be to, uh, to be victim focused. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Congo. If no other questions, uh, I'm, I just had a couple in closing. Was there, were there any other questions from members of council? Okay. Um, uh, deputies, uh, could you just give us a bit of an update as to what we've seen in the last two years? Since the onset of COVID, almost everything has changed, lots of different ways. Um, but um, what are the trends we're seeing in terms of crime, harm and crime frequency in our city over the last two years? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, so I, I can uh, advise you that our, we, we've noticed a, a dip during COVID of both crime harm and crime volume. Um, uh, and uh, as a general statement, um, we have now see, uh, seen the increase, uh, not beyond previous measures. And so I, uh, the concept is um, uh, regression to the mean. There is a level of, of crime within our community. Um, and it's not beyond that, but it's certainly... Uh, not returning to normal because we don't want that to be normal, but it's certainly returning to pre-COVID, uh, both in terms of volume and harm. Um, that is a broad statement of where we're at right now. Uh, ideally, uh, with the harm-focused um, harm focused approach, we'd like to see that uh, reverse and see, you know, there is volume there, but if we can reduce that harm and be, the, be a focus there and show that measurable improvement. But right now it is trending upwards to pre-COVID levels, not in any drastic sense. It is a very safe city. Right, and I mean, one would expect a, a dip in certain types of crime just with, um, you know, the shutdown of, of you know, uh, some degree of public activity uh, inevitably. But there's been a lot of concern, of course, as well. And I know you said at the outset, one, uh, I've forgotten which one of you was, that, uh, of course, the challenge is that for some crimes, particularly intimate partner violence and others, uh, the reporting level can be um, depressingly low. Uh, and, um, you know, that's a project we all, all need to work on. But as a police service, we want to work on to uh, encourage and provide channels for um, women in particular to feel safe coming forward. During COVID, there was a specific concern about a rise in domestic violence. And I guess one of the challenges in knowing the degree to which that has occurred in our community or nationwide is, is that reporting challenge. But I'm wondering if either of you can speak to, uh, speak to what, we, what, what we do know over the last two years. Um, <clears throat> Mayor, thank you for the question. Um, I can say, uh, and I've reported to the board, um, over COVID, we've seen definite effect on, on all our crimes. Everything has been uh, slower. Um, we have seen, uh, even in this last lockdown, uh, I'll re be reporting to the board uh, in February, but our calls for service, even in the last transition ending today, I guess, um, our calls for service uh, had dropped noticeably. Um, I, I have to say, um, this is for a lot of obvious reasons um, that you already mentioned in that our communities are closed. Uh, restaurants are closed. Uh, people are staying home and uh, we don't have the same uh, traffic on our roads. Um, a big concern through COVID that has been reported, not just uh, in the media in Barrie, but through uh, the province is the, the effect it has on, on person's mental health. And we have definitely seen a climb in mental health calls and we have um, been uh, very active in, in dealing with that with our, our coast team. And uh, we look to other uh, means uh, to address some of those things um, through uh, community safety well-being initiatives, as well as uh, some new uh, human resource strategies that we are looking at employing uh, in uh, 2022. Uh, domestic violence, uh, highly reported in the news, um, and uh, we're seeing lots of stories about that. Um, again, to uh, Deputy Johnson's uh, state, uh, we only know what we know by what's being reported. And, and we do need to work uh, with you know, confidence in, in trusting the police, but also with all the partners in the community safety well-being plan and the action plan, uh, action partners in that 
everybody has a part of, of dealing with some of these things, helping the people um, through the different areas and, and projects that we have, whether it's the health accord, whether it's going to be the justice center, um, uh, the, um, the, the community hub, uh, one stop shop, all those places are going to have an influence on uh, what crimes are reported and how people can uh, work through the system uh, with a, a close partner, a trusted friend, if you will, in the community that can help get through that. But um, Deputy Johnson was correct. And we will see that our numbers go back to normal after COVID, but normal doesn't necessarily respond to everything that is going on in the community. And, um, and maybe, I, I, you know, I spoke to an earlier question with uh, Councillor Cungle about a community safety survey, but it's also uh, to re re uh, reiterate what Deputy Johnson said, uh, if people don't report things, we don't know it. And there is, uh, for many reasons, a lot of crimes that aren't reported. Uh, we welcome them. And, and, uh, and uh, the more we can deal with those victims of crime and set them up with our community partners uh, and the justice centers, and the justice, uh, uh, course of justice itself, uh, I think the better will be, but it is a very safe community. Uh, our numbers returning to normal are not something that uh, is, is, uh, it should raise concern for anybody. And again, if our reports to, of crime go up for the right reasons, then we should welcome that as well. All right, well, thank you both. You uh, delivered a presentation then I answered questions for uh, almost an hour there. I appreciate uh, both of your work and the fact that, uh, you know, I just wanted to say to members of council as well as a, as a member of the police services board, I remember my first ask for data like this in 2011. And I remember the attempt to create some Excel bar charts with the information that we had available at that time just to look at how much time was being spent by officers on calls to do what Deputy Johnson is talking about tonight, which is to look at the actual harm to people <laughs> that resulted from crime, but also the amount of time our, our own officers were having to spend. And issues like, um, you know, uh, being at um, the hospital for their entire shift as an officer um, because of a, an apprehension under the Mental Health Act for somebody who, who um, uh, was in crisis, and then they're not being the resources uh, to help that person and, and they're sort of sitting at uh, RVH waiting to see a psychiatrist. Um, those kinds of problems are detected <laughs> by the use of this information, not to, and I mean, that's an obvious one in the sense of the experience of our officers, and we certainly didn't need an Excel chart or, or maps to show that. But, but you know, what this does show, um, I think is, is a quite different picture than we've traditionally seen um, when you start to look at the actual impact on victims, which after all should, to my mind, be our priority. Uh, and that's that's not, not always an easy thing to measure. I know I think the Crime Severity Index, um, Deputy Johnson is developed by using a weighting that's based on the sentencing and sentencing you know, under the criminal code is supposed to reflect the impact on victims of the crime uh, loosely. But it's it is uh, it is a challenge, and I guess the, the reason to say all of that is um, the effort that's been made to actually look at the patterns of crime in our community and better target resources uh, are are light years better than they were uh, even a few years ago. Um, so how we use that information now is a is a really great question, uh, and it is a question I'm sure council will continue to be interested in, and we talk about it at the police board almost every uh, every month in one way or the other. Uh, but thanks for this. Um, I also think in general, more presentations from the police service to city council are a good thing. Uh, and so we welcome you being here tonight as the senior command and the work that you're doing in our community. And with that, we'll call the presentation concluded, I think, uh, and members, uh, and we'll thank uh, Deputy Johnson, Deputy Allen and Chief Greenwood. Thanks for being here tonight. Uh, it brings us members of council to inquiries of staff. Deputy Mayor Ward, do you have any inquiries of staff? I have none. Members of council, do you have any inquiries of staff? Seeing none, announcements. Deputy Mayor Ward. Uh, well, we've heard from the Affordable Housing Task Force. We've heard from the Performing Art Center Task Force. And next Monday, we're going to hear from the Market Precinct Task Force. And uh, keeping with all the adjectives people have been putting in lately. Last week, Councillor Harris asked for a fulsome report and tonight, Councillor McCann asked for a solid, solid. plan. I, 
solid plan. I assume that we'll, I assure council will give a both a fulsome and solid plan next week on the market precinct. In fact, we'll make it exciting and game changing as well. Oh, wow. See up to your adjective game there. I would have said I've been satisfied with a thorough report, Deputy Mayor Ward, but way to way to up the game. Uh, looking forward to that. Absolutely. Thanks, Deputy Mayor Ward, and, and advance to everyone who worked on that project to get to uh, to the presentation next Monday. Uh, other announcements, uh, Councillor Natalie Harris, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Um, that was, yeah, I'm a fan of the, the thesaurus. That's a tongue twister at this time of night. Um, I just wanted to uh, share a quick announcement that um, after some uh, long conversations with my family and friends and considering whether or not I feel like my role on city council is done. And I had mentioned that I was not going to be running again. Um, I just want to share that um, I will be running for mayor in the next term and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Harris. Uh, Councillor McCann, did you want to end on that? Go ahead. You're up next for announcements. I know. I'm not sure if I wanted to go after you, uh, Natalie. I'm not sure how to top that. Should I make an announcement? No. Um, and uh, I do have an announcement actually about uh, this weekend. Um, for those that are uh, paying attention to uh, uh, the uh, Love Berry sign, we've got a uh, uh, great momentum, and we're almost reaching our uh, financial goal of 200000 And uh, we're actually uh, partnered up with the uh, City of Barrie, with uh, Tourism Barrie, and with the VIA. And we're actually installing a 28-foot uh, in, uh, in length, six feet high ice sculpture with Love Berry. Uh, I'll be doing some promotions through the Love Berry uh, organization uh, to bring people down to the city and to uh, actually... Um, uh, help connect the city. I feel like I've lost all counselors because of Natalie Harris' announcement. So thank you, Natalie, and uh, good luck to you. But you I mean, uh, um, so hopefully uh, we can come back here and uh, hopefully I'll see all your all your support and love to see you down there. I think we're back in her team with Hello Barry did a fantastic job and uh, we're at half capacity now. We'll be at full capacity in about uh, you know 31 days, and it's time that we restarted. And we look to the future and we start making positive changes and positive mental, uh, you know, pivots. Because when you think more positively, you actually get more positive things. So this is what this Loveberry uh, campaign is about, about connecting and about bringing positivity to this town. So um, please, all welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Councilor McCann. Councilor Morales. No, don't worry. Um, <laughs> By the way, I have never laughed so hard at anything in announcements. And your, your comment, Dr. Councillor Harris, has to be the funniest. You can rule me out, out of order right now. It has to be the funniest thing I've ever heard in almost a decade of mayor comments during comments. So kudos. Already I, the weirdest announcements I've ever been in. So let's I have just never keep, on, so keep on rolling. Go ahead, Councillor Rowell. Uh, it's, it, no, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's bread and butter. There's a public meeting um, in Ward 9 for 667 to 675 Young Street. 5 p.m. neighborhood meeting. Uh, my apologies, not public meeting. Uh, the Zoom link, please make sure you register ahead of time. I'm running to this myself. Maybe we'll look to see how we can maybe future it. People think they can just go click the link or something um, at the time and you no, know, you register and then it gets sent, sent to you. So make sure you do it uh, hopefully the day before and we will see anybody there who's interested. Thanks, Councilor Morales. Uh, Councilor Ripa. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and uh, this one is really exciting. Um, uh, St. Vincent Park is a park that a lot of people love, a lot of people go to, and uh, we are doing a reimagining uh, of that park design, uh, particularly in the playground area, but the comments are all welcome. Uh, we, had a, we have a chalkboard uh, at the park, and people write their comments on it. Chalkboards have been filled and photographed a number of times already. Um, February the 17th at six o'clock, uh, we have a uh, public meeting. You have to register, it's online, um, but please connect and, um, and have your say about what uh, St. Vincent Park should look like. 
Thanks, Councillor Reepa. Uh, I did see another card, Councillor Kungel. Thank you uh, through you, Mayor Lehman. I wanted to express a, kind of a, an announcement with a thank you. So for those um, residents that experienced getting a vaccine at some of our city facilities, please continue to check locations because um, there will be changes coming up. And I wanted to use this opportunity to say a real heartfelt thank you uh, to city staff, especially those in facilities. And I know Don McAlpine and members are, of our leadership team have been involved in this. Um, and so sometimes we focus on public health uh, and the work that they're doing, but I wanted to give some recognition because we've moved locations, be it our Holly Arena to the Holly Gym, um, to um, using different space at our community centers at East Bayfield. Uh, and that comes with a bit of a toll and lots of logistics. And so as more changes come up around locations, um, I do want to thank in particular the um, uh, facility staff that have been incredibly accommodating around ensuring a safe uh, place uh, for those vaccine clinics to operate and managing a lot of daily requests um, as, we, um, as we manage through things. So thank you for that. And uh, that's all. Thanks, Councillor Kungle. Uh, I think I saw another placard. Was there somebody else who wanted to make an announcement? No? All right. Okay, well, I have a few. <clears throat> uh, effective today, Ontario began the process of easing restrictions while maintaining protective measures. Our rec centers open today, uh, along with uh, uh, other fitness facilities and of course, thank goodness, restaurants uh, and other affected uh, establishments around the city. Uh, for full up-to-date information on the status of our city services, visit barry.ca slash services. Uh, the annual I Love Barry contest has been extended the deadline until uh, February 28th. So if you would like further information on that, barry.ca slash myberry. Uh, in lieu of Winterfest for the second year in a row, the city presents Hello Winter, six weeks of fun, engaging and safe activities to help residents and visitors enjoy Barry's winter from fe uh, February 5th to March 20th. Specific activity details, including times and registration requirements will be posted at barry.ca slash hello winter. City has launched Service Barry Online to enhance the way Service Barry engages with citizens and providing a new convenient option to access city services. You can uh, do a whole bunch of things online that you couldn't do before. Visit serviceberry.ca to explore and register. Uh, Councillor Reepa mentioned the St. Vincent Park consultation, so I won't go through that. Uh, and the reminder I'm actually asked to give every week about uh, please put your garbage beside, not on the snowbanks. Uh, it is um, at greater risk of getting thrown all over your driveway in the snow clearing by mistake, uh, or and it uh, sometimes cannot be collected if it's up on the snowbank. So please put it beside the snowbank. And a reminder of Snow Angels Canada. If you have trouble clearing the end of your driveway after it's been plowed, uh, it is snowangelscanada.ca. Planning committee's up tomorrow night, February 1st at seven o'clock. Uh, and the next general committee meeting will be held Monday, February 7th. Um, the bylaws, Deputy Mayor Ward. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that Lee be granted to introduce the following bills, and this these bills be read a first, second, and third time this day, and finally pass Bill six and seven. It is moved by Deputy Mayor Ward, seconded by Councillor Thompson that Lee be granted to introduce the following bills. These bills be read a first, second, and third time this day and finally passed bills six and seven. Comments or questions? Okay, seeing none, I'll call the question. Those in favor? Any opposed? None, that carries. Bill oh, eight, confirmation by love. Please. Mayor Lehman, I was opposed. Just to keep oh. the consistency of the meeting because, you know, why not? <laughs> Why not? Uh, Why? Okay, sorry, please record Councilor Morales as opposed to Bill 6 and 7. How about the confirmation by law, Deputy Mayor Ward? Let's go for unanimity. Moved by myself, seconded by Councilor Thompson. That Lee be granted to introduce the following bill, and this bill be read a first, second, and third time this day and finally passed Bill 8. It's moved by Deputy Mayor Ward, seconded by Councilor Thompson, that Lee be granted to introduce the following bill. <laughs> this bill be read a first, second, and third time this day and finally passed Bill 8. It's the confirmation by law. Those in favor? Any opposed? 
None. We nailed that one. Anyone else got anything they want to say tonight? <laughs> I will take a motion to adjourn. Uh, Councillor Jim Harris, seconded by Councillor Kungle. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow night at 7 for the Planning Committee. Good night.